When you subscribe to WROK on YouTube, you never miss a meeting. Workspace always just gets spread out. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? All right? Okay. I'm pretty sure we're here. All here for the audit review committee presentation, correct? Okay, that's what I thought. It was exciting for us, and uh, it'll be exciting again tonight, right, John? All right. Well, I'm going to call to order the December 6, 2021 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by myself, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I ask that you stand if you can, please. Our hearts are hurting for the unnecessary and avoidable loss of our friends in Oxford that they continue to endure from last week's murders. Royal Oak stands in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Oxford and across the country who have endured the horrific pain that comes with senseless loss of innocent children and devoted educators. Let us offer a moment of silence to honor the victims, families, and all those impacted by the Oxford massacre last week. The pain of what happened in Oxford is felt beyond its village limits. Many in Royal Oak have a connection to victims, teachers, and students of Oxford High School. Every school-aged child, including our own, are robbed of the basic sense of security and peace of mind that is crucial to grow and prosper in an educational environment. Our kids will forever be scarred by the contempt of their parents' and grandparents' generation to make meaningful progress to keep them safe from gun violence. I know firsthand. My daughter is a freshman at Royal Oak High School. I can see it in her eyes. I don't have an answer for her as to why this patriotic nation loves its proverbial golden calves more than its own sweet, innocent children. As we grapple with our grief, it is natural to ask why this happened. At this point, we are beyond why, how, or what. The question is who allows the senseless acts of violence to continue? Will Oxford be another statistic or an inflection point? I guess that's up to each of us, each of you, and all those who have the power to make change possible. In the beginning of this invocation, I asked for a moment of silence to remember those lost from the Oxford murders. I now ask for a moment of silence to remember those lost at the next school massacre that will no doubt occur. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, before we get to the public comment part of our agenda, I'm going to take uh, chair privilege here. Uh, and insert a quick and brief agenda item uh, for the check presentation for the RUC 22. Um, okay, well, and maybe uh, just a little bit about the RUC 22. I don't know if you guys are aware, this has been an event that has been hosted in Royal Oak uh, in partnership with veterans organizations um, for a number, I think it's year five. Um, I know we had one year that it was uh, with COVID, I think, last year, where I think technically it still counts. Um, this is something that my family and I have been part of uh, since its inception. Um, it represents, the, the RUC 22 is a, is a way to raise money, um, raise funds, uh, but most importantly, raise awareness of the fact that on average, 22 of our brave veterans commit or die by suicide every day and um, that is a staggering statistic uh, it, it it pains and it hurts to understand that you know those who are willing to sacrifice so much come home and struggle so we um, in this city as well as other communities have, have stepped up and, and we're trying to gain more and more momentum every year to, to bring this awareness uh, to do whatever we can in our four corners of this community anyhow and provide the support needed um, to avoid, um, you know, this tragedy that we endure as a country. Um, I'll ask, uh, to, I guess we'll come up. Do we have the, is the, I looked at Judy, uh, Judy Davis. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. 
Good evening. I'd like to introduce Eileen Harmon and Bob Jerba. They're representing um, they're representing the Veterans Event Committee tonight. And this is Mr. Browning from the VA. So go ahead, Eileen. All right. Uh, I'm Eileen Harmon. Good mark off. Uh, and this is Bob Jerba. And um, the Ruck 22 is something that is really important uh, to our committee. Uh, we, we do Memorial Day. We do Veterans Day. But I think sometimes uh, some things get misplaced. And this year, we decided to make our donation to the Veterans Administration for suicide prevention specifically. And um, we raised a total of $3,798.48 for that event. And we'd like to give you those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, uh, Mayor. And uh, thank you for bringing that awareness uh, for suicide prevention. and. Uh, we know that uh, the money that we raised here would go to help uh, many veterans, but also the social revenue that was raised by the awareness raised by that, that event. We certainly appreciate that. And we need the help of each and every one of you in this room and all your citizens of, uh, of Royal Oak. And we know this is a fair uh, veteran community. We know there's a strong veteran presence here in the, in the city of Royal Oak, and we certainly appreciate all the help and support you provide us. Thank, Thank you. you. brings us to item number four, which is public comment. Um, is my mic on? Can you? No, the public comment. Oh, okay. It's on a TV. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the city commission. Um, please wait until you're called upon by me, the mayor. Come up to the podium. State your name and address for the record. Uh, please be mindful that uh, other people may wish to speak tonight, so we have limited comments to three minutes or less, and there's a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. We ask that comments be directed to the commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Um, and as always, uh, if you can't make it to the meeting tonight or any time, you're welcome to email us. Often it's good to get public comment ahead of the meetings. If you email us and contact us that way, uh, we can have time for some engagement prior to making decisions here tonight. I believe this will be the only time that you have to address the city commission as there are no public hearings scheduled for this evening. So with that, who's hey, first? Mayor, yes. a request. Um, could we offer speakers the opportunity if they choose to drop their mask so we can, we in the audience can more clearly hear them? Yeah, we can do that. I think we typically do that, but that's not a, that's not an issue. Okay. And we'll make sure the mic is working. So it looks like it's got a green light. So the first person that comes up might have to say test, test, but we won't use that against your time. <laughs> All right. Anybody wish to speak? Yes, sir. Hello. Test, test. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're here. All right. Um, my name is Dan Farhat. Uh, I live at 802 East 6th Street. Um, so I'm here to bring uh, Waterworks Park to your attention. Um, I assume some of you are familiar with it, uh, but perhaps some others aren't. Um, so I'll give you a brief background on it. Um, it's about a quarter mile north of 12 Mile um, and one block east of Crooks. Um, it's the site to a former Waterworks building uh, that was torn down about 30 years ago, um, but the six foot chain link fence that surrounded the area uh, has remained. And over the years, it's become somewhat of a storage facility for the city. Um, and I'm here because um, I have some concerns about the storage um, and having it there. One is that um, it's very unsightly to have this industrial storage right in the center of a what should be a really nice park um, in a nice neighborhood. Um, the, other, uh, the other concern I have is that um, I think perhaps housing prices around the park and in the area may be, might be lower than uh, they would otherwise be if the storage facility was not there, um, which is evidenced by some posts that we've seen on social media of people saying that they specifically did not buy around the park or in the area because of that area, because of the storage that was there. Um, so, and then the other, uh, one of the other reasons is 
Uh, they set up a soccer field in the summer um, on one end of the park. And if your kids have a soccer game there, um, you can't see your other children that are on the play structure on the other side of the park uh, because you have this huge storage facility there. Um, so, you know, those are some concerns that I have. Um, now, I appreciate that the city has acknowledged the blight um, and has appropriated $50,000 to $50,000 to address it. Um, however, I think it seems like the current plan is to use that 50000 for site screening and some additional plantings. Um, but I think uh, most of the residents in the area would like to see the storage removed rather than hidden. Um, so uh, in the last 30 seconds, uh, uh, I think there are two possible options uh, that might work, but I'm sure the city can you know, come up with their own plans. But I think uh, the facility possibly at 13 and Campbell, or excuse me, at 12 and Campbell um, might be able to accommodate some of the items that are at Waterworks. Um, another possible solution uh, might be the vacant land that's behind uh, the batting cages um, that the city owns. It's been vacant for a long time. Perhaps the city has plans with it. Um, but both locations seem like a much better place for all this storage than in the middle of a residential park that's surrounded by housing. Um, so I would uh, encourage the commission, if you haven't been to the park, to go visit it. Um, make up your own mind about whether it's something you would want uh, you know, in a park by your house um, and consider having it removed in just green space rather than hiding it with additional plantings. Thank Thanks. You, All right, who's next? Hello. All right. My name is Stephen Phipps. I live at uh, 503 Lloyd Street. I live at the corner of Lloyd and Marywood, which is uh, right across the street from the city park. And um, for three years, I've been coming out of my house and, and looking at the green recycle bins stacked sky high. I've been calling, you know, and talking to several people and complaining minor improvements will, are made. I do believe a, a picture, as they say, speaks a thousand words. Is it okay if I pass you guys some photos? Yeah, so these are photos. And I mean, uh, there's kids in the neighborhood, teenagers mostly, climbing in the area. You know, to be clear, you're talking about Waterworks Park? Yeah. Okay. The center of Waterworks Park, the storage. So as I mentioned, you know, this is an unmarked area. There's no indication who owns the area. Um, the fence lines you can see from every angle around this park, and please drive by the park. Drive around the park two times, and I swear you will agree, without a doubt, that does not belong in this neighborhood. It's a residential area. There's semi-trucks pulling in and out. Um, in, in one of the photos, you'll see semi-trucks at 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, just this past morning. And I have a petition here for... 28 signatures and, and counting. I mean, we had a meeting last Thursday in the park to, to allocate the $50,000, as Dan indicated, and pretty much the overwhelming message from all the residents were this area needs to be removed, to save the money, and have the area removed, um, which is exactly what I'm thinking. So um, if you want to look at it, I have this petition. You know, we're going to keep getting signatures and, and build up the email base, and, and we're going to keep coming, and, and hopefully you guys will agree that this area needs to go as soon as possible. Um, there's hardly anything in there you can see from the pictures the area is probably maybe 20 percent utilized it consists of concrete bricks uh old rusted trailers old rusted dumpster um there's a, um, a fire truck trailer that people says hasn't moved in nine years there's recycle bin because somebody in the city ordered too many recycle bins and so i got to look at them every day they're stacked up and that's my plain viewpoint but any place around this area you're going to see some of you would not buy a home just because of this area across the street. Um, you can, you'll notice around this area there isn't a lot of these new home constructions, uh, and I think it's specifically for that reason. A lot of people are just going to not want to live there because of that. Uh, I mentioned the children climbing in there at night. You, know, you can hear kids screaming in there, things like that. Someone's going to get hurt, right? Then what happens? The, I mean, the city's going to get sued. The, mar the area isn't marked. The fences aren't the right height, right? For, this doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. Um, I guess I, I'm here, I want to get added to the agenda so that we can discuss, you know, possibly for the next meeting. I don't know if that's something I can request right now or if you guys need to discuss it or you want more details or you want to spend the time and drive around and, and we'll invite more people and, and continue to build a petition or, or how to go about this exactly. But 
Well, I think you're doing all the right things. I mean, we'll yeah. probably add it to the agenda tonight. We'll get some information from staff because okay. uh, it's not worth having a discussion unless we have some time for them to prepare us some, some information. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, a, a member here from the Parks and Rec Committee um, that I know personally. Um, and we can we can have a chat as well. So, okay. um, yeah, I think you're doing the right thing, bringing it to our attention. Whereas, I mean, I've seen my kids play soccer there, and always, you know, but I don't live there, so yeah. um, I've yeah. only had a few games. So. I mean, we'll yeah. be here again. We'll, we'll talk about it again, but it definitely it says a lot just to, to drive drive around the park twice during the day sometime, and uh, right. I think you'll you'll simply easily agree that it doesn't belong. But you're, you're doing the right thing. You came, made us aware. We can't solve the problem. We're not. Yeah, aware of course. Of. I didn't expect that. And then you offered yep. some solutions too. So I know it's just the beginning. Good. So. So we won't forget. Okay. My word. Should I grab my picture, sir? Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Commissioner Macy. I just want to say quickly, so I was at the meeting on Thursday. Um, <clears throat> the actual DPS director, Aaron Lipsky, called the meeting to talk to residents about these solutions. Okay. Um, and I did say to some of the people who were there, we have a Parks and Rec meeting actually this Thursday. Yeah. So at 7 p.m. at the Senior Center. Um, that would be another good place to get a discussion going. Yeah. Okay, so you suggest we go to that meeting as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think the other part of this isn't making something go away. It's how do you transform the space into something really cool? Yeah. You know, it's I not mean, always a negative. Grass, what can we do? Grass, or something if you want to add more to it. Yeah, it could be a, a, a center, a city center yeah. type thing, square like they do in Europe and stuff. So. Okay, right, thank cool. You, Thanks a lot. All right, who's next? Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Roberts, uh, 3011 Bamlet. Um, I'm not here in my personal capacity, though. I'm here as an attorney that works with uh, three different uh, cannabis companies that have submitted applications to the city of Royal Oak. Um, so why am I here? Well, applications were due um, February 1st. It has now been more than 10 months since those applications were due and submitted. Um, to give you a comparison, you know, Ferndale took about 30, 60 days to review, process, and award licenses for their application period, which was just a few months ago, and also, you know, was affected by COVID delays. So I'm here to ask that the city move forward with this process, whether that's, you know, finishing up the scoring or releasing the results, or maybe the results are already there and they just need to be publicly released. But I would just kind of highlight that there is kind of harm going on right now to applicants, to property owners, to people that live right off Woodward. And I did just move right off Woodward. I'm about five houses in. And, you know, there's a number of vacant buildings that I see that I know why they're vacant. I actually even in some cases know who applied under those buildings. And, you know, right now those buildings are essentially just kind of sitting in limbo. No one can move forward with development. The property owners don't know what to do. You know, they don't know if the person's gonna close on it or not. Uh, the applicants, I know, have incurred fairly significant carrying costs, just trying to pay the property owners to get more extensions. Um, and, you know, someone like myself would very much like to see, you know, their favorite Thai food restaurant open back up. Or, you know, maybe someone do something about the Manus Power Mowers building, because that's something I gotta see every day. Um, so, you know, I'm just here to just respectfully request that the city move this process forward um, so everyone can kind of move on, you know, the property owners, the applicants, those who have to live and drive on Woodward every single day. So, you know, I just ask that, you know, to the extent to which these are already scored, um, that the licenses get rewarded. And to the extent they're not, you know, we can finish up the scoring process and hopefully, you know, bring this process to a close. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Anybody next? Yes, ma'am. Hi everyone. Um, I, I'm Neil Lamb. I live in the main north building, right, right over there. And um, I'm just following up on um, item number eight. When I was, when I was here back in November, um, talking to the traffic committee, um, I believe from the decision from the committee at that time was to um, 
because the intersection where that building, where our building is at, is um, North Main and uh, East University, and um, the the visibility right there is very tough to uh, make a left turn to head south or even to make a right turn to head north on Main Street. And um, the committee at the time agreed that one sp parking space should be removed, but um, I, I would like to request that two parking spaces be removed um, to because that would actually um, be, according to the MDOT guideline that the, the, the traffic committee um, uh, proposed as well. So that would actually fall under that guideline to increase the visibility. And um, uh, because that corner um, making a left turn, we're, we're kind of at a dead end there. There's no way to head south b besides turning there. And there's that new crosswalk that was built there which makes it really tough. And then, you know, with 11 mile right there, there's a lot of traffic coming out as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of just being preventative if we can remove two spaces, I, you know, that would be really, um, would really help the safety of the nearly 200 residents in our building. And also the Imagine Theater, when it was really up and running before COVID, a lot of people would exit that way as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so I, I just wanted to follow up on that and hopefully the, the commission um, agrees with two spaces. And and two spaces, I feel, um, because there's a big parking structure right there as well, so it wouldn't really affect the um, city tavern, um, I feel, business that's right there. And there's a, a ton of parking spaces for carry out too, right on university itself. So I feel like just two spaces right on Main Street would just really help just the safety of mm -hmm. residents and, you know, business patrons and everyone as well. So I thank you. All right, anybody else tonight? Going once. Going twice. All right, we're gonna close public comment and bring the meeting back to this side of the table. Uh, that brings us to number five, which is the approval of the agenda. Mr. Bruce? Let's see if I can turn this on. I'll move approval of the agenda. Okay, motion by Commissioner Perush. Oh, Mr. Bray. So if I can uh, clarify, so this is based on the amended agenda. So there were some items that were removed, just for clarity. The file and received, the, there were um, uh, just a, a few items that were taken off of the agenda. So I, I just want to make sure that uh, uh, that is appropriate. So. I'm moving a rule of the agenda as we see it on our screen. Yes. Is that the correct okay. agenda? Yeah, that's a revised one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, motion by Commissioner Perush. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. All right. Discussion on the agenda approval? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All righty, that brings us to the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything off the consent agenda for further discussion? Commissioner Cola, which item would you like to pull off the consent agenda? Item J, please. To confirm J, approval of Jackson Five Star Catering. Okay. Anybody else? All right, the consent agenda now consists of the 50th City Commission meeting minutes from November 22nd, 51st City Commission meeting minutes from November 22nd, claims November 30th and December 3rd, approval of purchase orders, approval of the Michigan Department of Transportation Agreement for Master arm upgrades of the I-75 bridges, Sherman Drive landscaping improvements, approval of special assessment, Santa Resolution 1, special assessment paving of public parking on Delamere Boulevard, approval of administrative rule changes for executive department heads, confirmation of city manager's appointment to the downtown development authority. Uh, does, uh, um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as read? Uh, I see uh, Commissioner Colo, seconded by Commissioner Perush. All right, discussion. All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. That brings us to approval of Jackson Five Star Catering Inc. Request for Rent Reduction 2021 Woodward Dream Cruise. Commissioner Polo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I see Mr. Fidelli walking out. I think these questions might be most appropriate for him right now. Hi. Hello. Good. So um, I, I guess my, so Mr. Mayor, this, uh, this item is a, looks like a request from a catering company that services um, Woodward Dream Cruise. Um, and I guess, what, so a couple questions here. 
Um, is this a program that we're offering at large, uh, Mr. Berger, Mr. Fidelity, to all the vendors we have in town? Uh, this was from a request from the actual vendor um, to for a reduction in the rent. Uh, they host a concession, and their concession for the Woodward Dream Cruise consists of uh, food trucks or food vendors. Mm -hmm. um, due to the pandemic, she has lost uh, probably about half of her uh, food trucks or vendors that she typically has on a, uh, a regular season or regular event. Um, and because uh, of that, her revenues were down um, significantly, so she's requesting a reduction in the uh, the agreed uh, rent. And then were those revenues shared with the city? Yes. Okay. Because they're not in the packet, and I, I guess that would that help me get here. You know, if, if we're going to do a program for someone, if we're going to do a reduction for one vendor, I think we need to do it for a lot of vendors. And we've had some pretty robust programs. We had, you know, the downtown. Um, we did all the spaces for free, the cafe dining, and they had a tangible benefit for rural residents because they had places to sit. During Arts, Beats, and Eats, we sponsored some booths for restaurants that gave our downtown restaurants the ability to have booths and places to go. And then we also had a free kids zone, you know, a bounce house for kids. It was outside outdoor activities. We're looking at another use of city funds tonight for a business, but they're providing something back to the city. Um, I just, without a program in place here, where we're going out to a vendor and saying, hey, we know it's COVID, if you provide X, if you have a, if, if we have a metric, a program in which we give people money, that's one thing, but I'm not sure we should get into the business of someone just coming to us and saying, hey, we need half off without some sort of metric um, in the first place. And that wasn't a question, sorry. So if I may respond to that, so all the examples that you gave are in the downtown area. So we haven't had any concerted effort outside of the, the central business district area. So I would say on a case by case basis, but that's purely your discretion. But if you want to delay that, we're, we provide additional information, but it's, it's feel comfortable on what Mr. Fidelli is describing to you, if the revenues are down, uh, that we make the, the accompanying adjustment. So. I guess I can any can all the vendors from Bark in the Park go back to us and tell us you know they had less people this year too so please you know pass them so I I just I, I like I like the idea I mean we're here to help we did have a business program though that was beyond downtown with the uh, CBDG CARES Act money that we eliminated because no one was using um, but, you know we did have programs available to businesses and the county has programs in fact Jackson has. They've taken uh, $200,000 in PVP loans. So there's money out there and available to them. Um, so I, I guess I would look at a program, not just a individual coming and asking for funds, uh, but look at this holistically and how we're doing this as a city. Well, just one question I may have too is like, how do we know that we're not throwing good money after bad? Meaning, you know, if we offer this check now, are they gonna be around for the next 22 Dream Cruise? You know what I mean? You could, they could not pay their full amount and then they're not around even. You know what I mean? You're throwing money in a well that you're never gonna get full. So so their, their contract is expired this year. Um, per the RFP that was put out, uh, I believe in 2016, 2015, 2016. Okay. So this is their last year that they were under contract for that rented space at Memorial Park for the Dream Cruise, which um, if this was the case, um, we could still take it out for uh, for a bid process like we did back uh, in 2015. So they they were done in 2021, and we don't have them lined up for 2022. Correct. I would think that'd be part of the negotiation. This would be on the table for a 2022 and beyond negotiation. Okay, just my thought. I can't take my business hat off. Any other comments, Commissioner Macy? Uh yeah, I guess I feel <clears throat> what Commissioner Cole's proposing sounds somewhat backwards to me. That if someone comes because they've had a, a they they're struggling and they're asking for a break, we say no, whoa, whoa, whoa. We suddenly we have to give everyone a break. I mean, maybe the people aren't struggling or they could have asked. I don't understand the concern about people coming forth with this without us proactively going after them and saying, here, let us give you money off. Um, it, it seems like the, con the conception of it seems backwards to me. Commissioner Cole. I guess what I'd say to them, uh, Commissioner Macy, is let's make a program then so that we're helping everyone equally. So that if you know if someone comes to us, they've identified a need, 
a gap that might exist in the services that we offer, that's great. Let's put together a comprehensive program that we can help all the vendors that we deal with that might have been impacted by COVID. You know, maybe this is a $10,000 program, $100,000 program that we give out money based on the need of the community. Um, but, you know, I'm just not sure that the needs, especially in this letter, the needs have been identified beyond COVID happen. Commissioner Kluge. If I understand the circumstances the way Mr. Venetelli has described it, not only have they been a vendor for a period of years, but also their circumstances are pretty unique. And because of that, I don't have any problem at all with, with granting this request. Um, this is not gonna happen to, to very many vendors. They're unique in the fact that they don't have a brick and mortar business, which is what a lot of our economic incentives through the pandemic program were, were geared toward. Um, this, is a, this is a person who manages other businesses in terms of their food trucks and, and coordinating them with the, the, um, with the Dream Cruise. It's unique that way. I think her circumstances are unique. Um, and as a result of that, I don't have any problem with approving this and I will move approval of this recommendation. Motion by Commissioner Bruce, is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion, uh, Commissioner Douglas. Uh, yeah, I wish I knew that the um, reduction in uh, what they're going to pay us results in better wages for the employees that they did retain. Do we have any evidence of that? I don't, ha I don't have any evidence of that uh, as far as uh, the increase in their wages. Um, the only evidence I have is uh, the reduction of how many food vendors they had um, compared to they had in previous years, um, which resulted in a loss in revenue for them. So, and, and uh, unfortunately their contract expires as expired, so we don't even have the ability to um, perhaps ask them for concessions in 2022, um, unfortunately. Um, I'm sympathetic here, but I, I sort of wish we had a, a little bit stronger hand, but I, I, it doesn't seem that we do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic as well. I mean, I get it. My challenge is, you know, as a steward of the, the city's money and maybe at the risk of sounding like kind of a, a jerk negotiator here, um, I'm trying to understand the benefit the city gets out of this. Certainly, I wouldn't look at them as a business in town. I'd look at them as a vendor. You know, no different than, um, you know, if someone came to us and they were, you know, planting trees or something like that or, you know, and said, hey, look, I can't make it work anymore unless I get more money. I can't fulfill my contract. We would sit down with them and we'd say, okay, let's walk through your contract, understand your labor costs, let's figure it out. And if we have to pay more to get the job done because of sort of a force majeure situation, uh, there's a benefit because the city would get continuity of service, right? In this particular case, the contract has expired. There's no continuity of service that we're trying to protect. It's basically just a handout and we have no verification, validation, or anything like that. And as much as I am sympathetic, um, I, I just struggle to um, understand how, now if this was tied to the fact that, you know, this is the only way they're gonna be able to renew their 2022 agreement or something like that, then I think I could be on board. Um, but, I mean, I just, it's difficult for me to support it uh, for those reasons, I guess, at, at this point, unless my colleagues can convince me differently. Commissioner Macy? I don't know if I can convince you differently, but they're a lot more likely to want to bid again in 2022 if they can see that the city is responsive to the situation on the ground. And when they have a difficult year, that, they, that we are supportive of them and we want to get them have, have their business here again. And not just them, I would assume, but other vendors. Like if they're going to be looking at who's going to do this in 2022, and the cost is firm at 15,000 because the city won't give it back if you, if it turns out that that doesn't work for you, then that might impact how our our future. I, I would just argue if they're interested in the 22, the next contract, they'd bid 7,500 then. Uh, Commissioner Frisch. I think the thing that's persuasive for me too is that we're talking about 7,500 dollars. Mm -hmm. which in the scheme of things, in terms of our budget and the overall budget for Wood and Room Cruise is, is, is a drop in the bucket. That's not to say that it's not in, insignificant, but on the other hand, we're not talking about $75,000, we're talking about a loss of $7,500, which to us, in terms of our overall Dream Cruise budget, is not gonna have that much of an impact. But when you're talking about a small business, it may be enough to put her over the edge and then she's gonna be out of business, and I just don't want that responsibility. I think the loss, and I think she's coming forward with a genuine request, 
explaining why she can't pay the rent, why she would like a reduction. And I think a $7,500 reduction is reasonable given those circumstances. Anybody else? All right, so I'll call for the book. Oh, Commissioner Dubuc. I got some kind of torn. I understand Commissioner Colo's desire to have more process here and, and not just a request from a vendor um, with you know, little documentation um, to, to justify this is 50% is the right reduction um, for, for the harm that's been done uh, you know, during a, a difficult year. Uh, but then again, you know, we, we do have you know, dollars to invest in this sort of uh, accommodation, although I don't think this is necessarily tied to ARPA dollars, but could be. Um, and that's specifically what the dollars are for, support small business owners. Uh, and going forward, it would be nice, um, you know, as, as we start building our process around how we're going to invest the dollars we do have available um, to have a bit more of a process, since we do work with a lot of different vendors and a lot of them probably have legitimate claims to having had a hard year. And I just want to be setting the number arbitrarily at 50%. Mm -hmm. um, but as Commissioner Proust said, this is not a significant amount of money and, and given the, the circumstances that are laid out here, I don't think it's an unreasonable request. But going forward, I would like for us to establish some sort of process for these kinds of requests. Okay, you know, and I appreciate those comments. I just am, am gonna stick with the fact that the contract's over and there's no, I mean, guarantee that this person's gonna bid on the business again or even be in business. And without those assurances, I don't feel, I mean, I figure $7,500 could be used helping another small business in Royal Oak. Um, Commissioner Hunt, do you have your hand up or no? Okay, sorry. This is contrary to everything that I do in my day job, <laughs> considering this contract is over. And, um, you know, performance has already occurred, but I agree with uh, what Commissioner Peru stated. Uh, this is $7,500, it's not a huge in the grand scheme for us, for the city, but it is for a small business. Um, and uh, having the support of the city, knowing you know, that we'll be supportive of them moving forward, um, I think would mean a lot to the small business, so I would be supporting this motion. Anybody else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. 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 Okay. Ms. Braswell, did you get the nose? Can you show me hands? Got it, thank you. Okay, guys win. All right, well, I wish best of luck, and I think that the expectation of the commission would be that this particular vendor bid on the, the business next year and, you know, uh, negotiate in good faith. All right, so that brings us to the end of the consent agenda, which brings us to number seven, the acceptance of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021 financial audit report and annual comprehensive financial report. I believe Ms. Rudd is gonna kick us off here. All right, Ms. Rudd. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Commissioners. Um, yes, this is the request for the acceptance of the annual comprehensive financial report in addition to the um, auditor's communication letter and um, the single audit report. Um, all those reports are um, attachments um, with the uh, commission letter that's been provided. Um, the audit review committee met one week ago. Um, the principal at Raymond, who, uh, which is our auditing firm, uh, Mr. Balderman is here this evening. He met with um, the balance of the audit review committee, the city manager, myself, and the assistant finance director. And um, we spent uh, a couple hours uh, going uh, through the reports and um, the committee um, unanimous unanimously accepted um, all of the reports and uh, also recommended that the city commission uh, do the same. And those draft minutes are also provided in the packet this evening. Um, the uh, chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Maton, is here this, this evening as well. And um, I just have a, a few um, fiscal matters that I would just like to point out from the report at some point this evening. Um, I have them bulleted in the letter. But um, again, Mr. Uh, Balderman here is here. He's a principal um, at uh, Raymond. And, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Maton is here as well if you have any questions for, for either of those two. Okay. Uh, Mr. Maton, Mr. Balderman, I'll leave it up to Mr. Maton. What do you want to do? Do you want to come up first to make your comments or do you want to defer to the presentation and then comment after as the chair, sir? That's it. 
or just yeah I, I have um, a handful of comments on okay. uh, financial matters of, uh, as of uh, June 30th of 21 um, and those are bulleted there uh, first um, uh, I think most importantly the auditor um, issued an unmodified report um, which is um, the better of the opinions so um, uh, very happy for that um, the uh, first fiscal uh, matter in the report uh, I wanted to um, point out that the water sewer fund, the recreation fund, and the ice arena funds all had deficit uh, unrestricted net asset positions um, at year end, uh, mostly due to the um, pension and OPEB bond liabilities that were issued in 2017, and that's just uh, carry, that's been carrying over uh, since we um, issued those bonds. Um, however, these funds have positive working capital at year end, and the state uh, treasury department considers uh, current assets that exceed uh, current liabilities are, as an exception to the deficit el elimination plan that's required. Um, so uh, we will not have to follow those for those funds, um, for any funds. But um, then um, the third bullet point. I would like to um, just point out that the auto parking fund had a net position of negative $1.2 million. Operating revenues um, were lower than budget, and um, we believe that's due to uh, COVID, the COVID pandemic. Um, another um, concerning um, issue with that fund as well is that the pledge of revenue coverage was only 24% and we have a revenue bond covenant of 110%. Um, the general fund had an unassigned fund balance of approximately $14.9 million, and that's an increase in fund balance of uh, $1.3 million. And that's mostly uh, due to the CARES Act money. Um, over $3 million of CARES Act money was receded in the public safety fund, so then we were um, able to reduce the transfer out from the general fund to the public safety fund. Um, so that helped the general fund uh, position. Um, in addition, we had the state shared revenue um, come in about three, excuse me, $1.35 million in excess of um, how we budgeted. And um, if you remember, um, we were budgeted when COVID pandemics uh, first began. And um, there were some concerns um, about um, the state shared revenue, and so the commission felt better if we had we lowered that um, that budget. So what ended up happening is uh, the revenues came in very well. However, our, our court revenues um, were very low, and it was pretty much an offset. Um, they offset each other. So um, an, another. Um, reason for the um, general fund position coming out better than budgeted is our general government expenditures um, came in much lower than, um, than budgeted, and that's mostly due to the court. The court personnel um, um, actual expenditures were significantly lower than budget. Um, they, had, um, they have a significant uh, part-time staff there that was not uh, working. Uh, due to COVID, and, and they were uh, much slower than normal, slower business. So um, that was a significant uh, reason for the decrease um, in expenditures relative to budget. And then um, we had um, quite a few vacancies as well in numerous uh, departments. So um, Then the DDA fund, um, we have a large unassigned fund balance of um, approximately $3.5 million. And I um, also want to mention, um, and this is also mentioned in the um, independent auditor's letter, that the um, construction, state construction fund fund balance is very large at uh, approximately $12.7 12 million. Okay. Thank you. Very good uh, recap. Any questions for Ms. Rudd at this point based on the information she provided so far? Okay. Mr. Mayden, please come up. The chair extraordinaire. <laughs> we came to the determination at the meeting that John's tenure is now eligible to drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I figured out this year I've been on, the, on this committee for 21 years, so 21 rousing meetings of the Audit Review <laughs> Committee. <laughs> so um, the big news for this year is the name of the report has changed. It's not the comprehensive annual financial report anymore. It's the annual comprehensive financial report. Wow. So yeah, that was uh, 
the big news to celebrate this year. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it, yeah, as Julie mentioned, we went through the, uh, the review committee, we walked through the audit review process by Nate. There was no significant deficiencies or things to really talk about or suggestions to be made. You know, we talked about that as a group. Are there anything that we would recommend to the commission as changes being made or uh, any other type of recommendations? And there's really nothing that we had to, uh, to add to that this year. So we do thank the, first of all, the finance com uh, department for preparing for this. And it's obvious from the audit that they were very well prepared for the audit to be done as proven by the certification that they get each year uh, for the financial reporting. And also like to thank uh, Riemann and Nate in particular for the job that they do in walking us through this. So if you have any further questions, you can uh, ask Nate. If not, we recommend acceptance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayden. Any questions for Mr. Mayden? Here. All right, any questions for Mr. Balderman? All right, Mr. Balderman. All right, I will be very brief because they've pretty much said it all um, <laughs> in terms of the report. The only thing that I would add is on top of everything else, we did uh, conduct the single audit. We haven't really touched on that a lot. Um, but this year, uh, again, like he said, there were no findings in that single audit. Um, just so you know, the programs that we were testing, we went over this in the meeting as well. Uh, the CARES Act money was the focus of our testing. Um, looked at all those programs through Oakland County and the state of Michigan. Uh, without any findings. So, um, and we also had the separate letter where we had the comments that they were talking about. There were a couple of comments in there related to a couple different matters, um, but we went over those with the committee as well. So, questions, for Mr. Baldwin? We want more of a rhetorical question. So, um, just for educational purposes, this document here is our annual comprehensive financial report. So, in your opinion, we can rely on these numbers to make decisions here at the body, the commission. Correct. Yep. That's the, the purpose of an audit and what that uh, unmodified opinion means. And you had a citizen committee, a review committee. One, you know, Mr. Maiden has 21 years of experience. We had other folks on the committee, some actually in private sector auditing. We went through this and they also agreed, yep, the audit looks like it was done properly and well. And so therefore we recommend you accept it and that we can rely on these numbers here as accurate and true. Correct. And you also do this for a number of other communities and cities in your tenure. Yes, um, I've done this for my entire career, 25 <laughs> years, uh, and through several uh, communities in the area as well. So, and I mean, in your opinion, would you say just in general, and, and, to, and I appreciate if you don't want to, because because you're auditing, but are, are these financial documents pretty transparent? Yes, they're very transparent. I mean, that's part of going through the process that you do with the annual comp comprehensive financial report. Uh, going for the GFOA award that you've gotten for, for a number of years, for several years now. Um, you know, that's the, that's kind of the highest standard that's out there uh, in the country. Uh, and so it, it, it meets those uh, requirements and the, and those standards for transparency. So. so in summary, we have transparent documents that we can rely on that are so transparent and reliable because of our great staff and team that uh, they win awards that show that these, this document, re, you know, at the highest level, and that we've had a citizen committee review these financials, or not the financials, but review the audit as well, and everybody says, this is a good document, you know, Royal Oak should be proud of it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, working with me as I uh, depose you in front of the entire <laughs> public audience here. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Thank you. Any, any other questions? And, and Ms. Rudd, just in your notes here, um, I noticed that you know we budgeted for the general fund, but the takeaway is, is not only did we not, you know, have a lower fund balance in our general fund, but for all these reasons, we actually ended up ahead in our general fund for the last fiscal year. Correct. The original budget was almost 2.9 million use of fund balance. And we added um, 1.3, and mostly due to the CARES Act um, assistance. That was about a little over $3 million. That's a $4.2 million swing. Mm -hmm. And three of that was the CARES Act. Yep. And, yep. and the, and the uh, balance of that were um, vacancies and um, mostly um, court savings. So about 700000 of that was savings in the court. But we had lower revenues um, over in the court. However, 
the increase in state shared revenue offset the lower revenues in the court. So we're so. effectively able to help remediate yeah. through our own actions and through the help of, you know, the feds, our um, situation with COVID. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's a good sign. That's a community effort there. It's a big staff effort too, so thank you. I mean, I think that's an important takeaway, not just that that number is accurate, but that uh, it happened. Okay, and seriously, Mr. DeCamp, Ms. Red, excellent job to you and your entire staff. All right, we have a recommendation here in front of us um, to accept the annual comprehensive financial report and international or independent auditor's report on internal controls. Does anyone wish to make a motion? We have a motion by Commissioner Proosh. Is there a second by anybody? Second by Commissioner Hunt. All righty, discussion on this? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, thank you very much. We'll see you next year, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Stick around long enough. We'll get that discount on auto insurance for your uh, tenure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this brings us to number eight, which is the approval of the November 2021 Traffic Committee resolutions. I sense Ms. Donahue is in our presence, and she is. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Commissioners. Uh, tonight, I'm here to present recommendations from the Royal Oak Citizens Traffic Committee from their November 16th meeting, which was chaired by Dan Godek. Um, he asked that I summarize the recommendations tonight, but also asked that I wish you a happy and safe holidays on his behalf. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and summarize the six proposed resolutions. And then, of course, I'm happy to take any questions during or afterward. So the first recommendation is from agenda item 6A. And in this case, we received a uh, speeding complaint for East 3rd Street, and this is a block from Kaiser to South Alexander. Uh, we had a request to install four-way stops at the intersections of 3rd and Kaiser, and then also at 3rd and Alexander. The 85th percentile speed was measured to be 18 miles per hour on East 3rd Street, and so for that reason, no changes were recommended related to speed. Um, stop signs, of course, are not installed to control speeding, but we did evaluate those intersections just to see if there were any other warrants that might be met for a stop sign, um, and none of the warrants were met for those two intersections. So for 6A, no changes are recommended. Uh, the next recommendation is agenda item 6B, and that's related to congestion near the intersection of Knowles and East 4th Street caused by on-street parking. Uh, we had a requester um, ask that we prevent vehicles from parking on the west side of Knowles, just south of East 4th Street. With the signage that's currently there, there's still enough room for one vehicle to fit on the west side of Knowles uh, before that first driveway south of 4th. And so you can have kind of a congested situation there um, if there's already a vehicle heading northbound to turn onto 4th Street. Um, so at a minimum, um, the, the no parking this side of sign sign is already kind of in the wrong spot. It should be moved at least 10 feet south to comply with the Michigan Vehicle Code for the distance from the crosswalk. Um, the traffic committee is recommending that we move it a bit further south to basically eliminate that one parking space that exists between East 4th Street and the first driveway south of East 4th Street. Um, currently that area is signed for one hour parking anyways, and there's parking for the business as well as parking on East 4th Street. So we did not think that would be a, a big hardship on the business for that one spot to, um, to go away. And so that's what the committee is recommending. The third recommendation is from agenda item 6C. Um, this was a request for a new traffic signal on Catalpa between South Washington and the railroad tracks. And the primary purpose was to assist with students crossing the road to attend Royal Oak Middle School. The traffic study found that the area did not meet the warrants for a traffic signal. And staff originally re recommended that we install a crosswalk signage and also just the six inch white crosswalk striping at the intersection of Catalpa and Marywood to provide a little bit more visibility for pedestrians crossing the road. Um, and the reason being that there's already ramps installed at that intersection. Uh, the traffic committee instead is recommending that we do a crosswalk at Edgewood instead, um, thinking that that's a more central location and also a little bit further from that existing traffic signal that's at South Washington. So probably more likely that students will actually use it um, at Edgewood. So if approved, the city would install new ADA compliant ramps 
um, during the 2022 construction season, um, installed six inch white crosswalk striping and pedestrian crossing signs uh, to be installed afterwards. So probably summer or fall next year. Um, officials from Royal Oak Schools were made aware of the request and our recommendations and they were in favor of the recommended changes and didn't have any additional comments to add. Uh, for item 6D is our next one. Um, this is related to the intersection of North Main Street and East University. I think we had one public comment on this issue. Um, the concern here is that there's not enough sight distance for drivers who are um, parked or driving on East University to safely enter the roadway of North Main Street, particularly for left-hand turns. Uh, the requester is requesting that we remove two parking stalls on the east side of Main Street to help improve the sight distance. The current location, it does not meet the MDOT recommended standards for sight distance on a 25 mile per hour road. And um, when meeting at the staff level before we had our traffic committee meeting, um, we meet with police, fire, DPS and planning. Um, staff together kind of voted that we not remove any parking spots there. The primary concern being that we set a precedent for the downtown area where we have a lot of parking kind of close to intersections and sight distance can be tricky. Um, however, the traffic committee did feel that removing one parking stall would at least help increase the safety for drivers on East University um, without creating any major um, hardships for the business that's there. So just to give you some numbers and for reference here, there's currently a sight distance of 120 feet. MDOT recommends that we have at least 155 feet for stopping distance. So that's, um, so a car coming at you has enough time to react and stop. Um, if they saw you in the, the roadway and weren't expecting you. Um, and they also recommend 280 feet for a comfortable left-hand turn that you see traffic in advance and make that left-hand turn comfortably. So if we go ahead and eliminate the one parking stall, that gives us 178 feet of clearance. So we're kind of between that um, 155 foot and that 280 foot, but closer to the low end of that. Um, so that would meet the stopping site distance with a little bit of additional footage, it wouldn't fully meet the left-hand turn distance recommendation. Just to be clear, these are guidelines. These are not standards that we are required to follow in any way, but they're just kind of give you a sense of what's uh, recommended by MDOT. Um, so staff uh, did send letters to the adjacent business that's there, uh, businesses along um, Main Street at University, um, just to make sure they didn't have any public comments or want to make complaints or have issues with that and we didn't hear anything back from them on this issue. Um, so just to summarize, the traffic committee is recommending removing the one spot um, for item 6D. Um, item 6E is located on Masoy Road. This is just west of Coolidge. We had a complaint that cars are parking too close to the intersection of Coolidge and staff went out there and did verify that drivers seem to be doing this pretty regularly where they park right up to the stop sign at Coolidge. Um, according to the law, they shouldn't be parking within 30 feet of a stop sign or 20 feet of a crosswalk, but people are doing it. Uh, the complainant noted that these vehicles seem to be coming from employees of Flexingate and parking there during the daytime hours. The committee is recommending that we do a no parking beyond sign, sign, located on the south side of the road, uh, 45 feet from the existing stop sign. Technically, it really only needs to be 30 feet from the stop sign, um, but then we would have just enough space where cars will probably try and fit two vehicles there that really can't fit and they will block a driveway. So we're recommending that we push it a little bit further to ensure that there's just one parking stall there um, for people parking on the roadway. And then additionally, we're also recommending a no parking this side of sign on the north side of Masoy, 20 feet from the crosswalk, again, just to make sure people are complying with the law there. The final item is 6F, and this is for a builder who is requesting that we install, or that he can install um, parking pads in the public right of way on North Campbell Road, and this is at the addresses of 706, 710, and 831 North Campbell. The requester submitted all the necessary documents in his pull-off parking applications and listed uh, pulling out onto North Campbell Road as the primary hardship there. Um, we have several other pull-off parking pads previously installed within the same area of North Campbell Road. And um, I have two resolutions presented here tonight. The first one is to approve the request for license agreements. And then the second actually authorizes uh, the mayor and clerk to execute the agreements. Um, so that concludes the recommendations from the traffic committee. Questions? Commissioner Macy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Audio. It was very... 
very thorough as usual. Oops, not touch screen. I forgot it's not touch screen. Um, so I have <coughs> questions. I think the first one I have is on um, 6C on the, the crosswalk. So you said that there's, it doesn't warrant um, a light there. And I, I wonder when, we, when you're looking at whether or not it warrants a light, are you looking like a regular traffic light or just like a crosswalk light where, you know, one of those lights that stays green all the time unless someone pushes the button? Um, uh, so we look uh, for either situation. Um, in this case, the only warrant that it had the potential to meet was the school crossing warrant. So if you're close to a school and you have a certain number of pedestrians crossing in the morning in the PM peak hours, um, you could potentially meet that warrant, um, but we did not see the volume of pedestrians crossing. Um, we kind of came close, but um, you also have to do a gap analysis that shows basically in a 30 minute time span, are there 30 opportunities for a student to cross that road with the recommended speed that a, a person would walk to cross that road, in this case, 14 seconds. Um, so we went out and took those measurements just to be sure and, and there was adequate gaps in the, the traffic to do that. Okay. Um, but, but I guess to answer your question a little more directly, uh, yeah, we would evaluate it for either situation. If it did meet the warrant, in this case, it would be one of those more simple ones that stays green until somebody requests to cross. Okay. I, I was wondering because it seems like if it, there were a safe crossing, you might get more people choosing to walk to school um, because it is, it is busy and they're very busy in the mornings, I can attest. Um, and it, so I'm happy that there's going to be a sidewalk there and a crosswalk there. I think that's going to be, be helpful. But I'm thinking about that, that line as well because I think that that would be uh, encouraging our, our students to walk to school. And I think we have a lot of students, including mine, who they don't live in that, that direction, but um, who would walk to school if it were easier and safer to do so uh, more regularly and something I'd like to encourage. Um, and then I wanted to ask about the uh, parking spots, the two parking space spots on Main. So those are just, at the moment you said, did you say that they're, what the limit is on those? Are those just regular parking spots? Yeah, they're just on street parking and the kind of the, you know, there's like a bump out near university. Right, and I think I know what it is. Like it's where you come out from the Imagine Theater, right? Yep. Um, I wonder if it makes a difference or if your thoughts on this, if the farther away, the second stall were instead limited in time parking, like just 30 minute or 15 minute parking, or maybe even like an Uber Lyft um, specialized spot, if that would mean that there, it still would be exist as a parking spot and could be useful for people, but also there wouldn't be someone there parked all the time um, that might be making it easier for people to get out. Just wondered about if that came up or your thoughts on that. Uh, my thought would be, Either you're okay with the car there or you're not. Um, even if it's 30 minutes, it could just be someone that cycles pretty regularly there. Um, it, it seems like during the daytime hours, those first spots aren't used uh, as heavily, uh, but in the evening, for sure, they, they get parked pretty regularly there. So um, I, I, it is a difficult turn. I'll, I will agree with that. Some questions? Question about Emer. I think Ms. Donahue, uh, one question, it looks like looking at the notes from all these meetings, all the recommendations tonight were unanimously approved by the traffic committee. That's correct. So no real minority report on any, any of these recommendations. No. Um, although it seems like it's kind of a special circumstance on 60 where um, staff recommendations sound like staff preferred no spot removal, they've recommended one. So sort of a compromise there with, with what uh, the request was. Um, I understand the concern about setting a precedent uh, where you know parking is a premium uh, around the CBD. It does look like this is a kind of a special circumstance where it's a residential parking area that it has its kind of dead ends. I mean, it, you could go through the parking lot, but basically there's no real other street outlet except for to, to get out there on university. Is that right? That's correct. I don't think there is any other similar situation. No, you'd have to, excuse me, you'd have to go through a parking lot to, to get out a different way. Right. But I mean, there's no other real res like where we have the other you know dense residential parking in the CBD. There's no other similar situation where where we would be setting a precedent. I think was the primary concern. I think we can call this a a unique circumstance. I was just looking around the map, and I can't see one where there's not some other outlet. But I might be missing something. None comes to mind, okay. but I won't. <laughs> All right, I won't hold you to it. But I'm looking at it too, and I don't see it. Um, so I think with regard to the request of the two or the one. 
Uh, I think starting with one is reasonable. If the residents still feel like it's not satisfactory, you know, we could always consider it again. But I think it is a substantial improvement to allow for the one spot. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, you know, I have the same question and concern, and you know, we didn't hear back from the business owner one way or the other on the one or the two. Um, you know, I don't. I mean, in my opinion, to, you know, I think they could almost, if you want with the one spot for sure, I'm fully supportive of that. You want to go with the second spot, it might be interesting. We saw some moped parking added to the downtown recently. I know that's exciting a lot of the moped riders out there. Bias alert, my wife belongs to a moped scooter club. Um, I won't tell you what their gang name is, but I'll tell you what, you better do your laundry and make your bed because, you know, if you hear those things humming, watch out. Um, but, I, but I do think it'd be interesting maybe instead of fully just, you know, conveying a second parking spot away, it'd be very interesting to me just try moped parking there or bicycle parking or something there, you know, that would um, liven up that second spot, but also provide visibility for, you know, encourage other forms of mobility. Not everything is just the car or moped. You have scooters, you have all this stuff, and maybe, you know, it's worth a little experiment there. Either we do something like 10 minute, five minute pickup or something like that. I, and, and, and the challenge that you have with this is not just what Commissioner DeBuck and, you know, highlighted being unique in the downtown with everybody kind of pouring out. I mean, man, that road is wide, and I know the speed limit says 25, but when you're on it, you know, it, you feel like you should go 45. Chief Moore, that's not a uh, incrimination <laughs> by anybody at this table, especially me. Um, but, uh, you know, it does feel like, you know what I mean? So people, especially they get out of town, they've been driving real slow, they look at it as like open road, let's go. And I think that's where you're seeing a lot of the, you know, it's the acceleration, not just the, the speed that people are traveling and it creates stress and conflict for people coming out of there. So, you know, to me, sacrificing an additional parking spot to play it safe, um, and if we do something creative with it, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. So I'll throw that out. I can't make motions, but I'll throw it out there for anybody that, that wants to consider an idea like that. <laughs> Commissioner Macy? All right. I'll um, move approval of 6D to remove one parking space with the addition of making the second parking stall um, moped or bike parking. Or motorcycle? Motorcycle, moped, bike? What are we talking about? Yeah, it could be moped and bicycle. Moped and bicycle. Yeah, yeah we could put a bike rack in there too. It could just be like this collection of stuff. Uh, maybe no <laughs> bike racks. Maybe no bike racks. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just, I think cars will hit them. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Really See, listen to the engineer. I think she's saying cars will hit all of them. <laughs> no, you, you said they, that cars would hit the bike rack. I think so, yeah. I, I think it'll get destroyed really quickly. People will think it's a parking spot. And... Yeah. Either hurt their car or hurt the bike rack, unless you protect it. Yeah. Paint a special color. But that nothing stops us from down the road getting innovative with the bike rack, so we don't have to put that order in now. Okay, I finished my motion. Okay, so we have a motion. Second. And we have a second by Commissioner Cole. All right, this is just for 6D, right? Yes. Not 6D, 6D. All right, uh, Commissioner Douglas. Is there demand outside of the mayor's spouse's motorcycle gang <laughs> and even that um i mean actually yeah i would say i mean i can sit on my street on alexander which is a cut through you know what i mean a lot of people drive through the avenue and i i mean i'm working from home been doing it for a year and a half now sometimes i sit out in the, the kitchen and you see a number on lincoln and a number on south alexander i can't quantify it but i do know that people are moving to alternative mobility um electric scooters mopeds um the, uh, um, my goodness, like you see the, the, just the regular scooters that you can drive, people have them on their own, so a place to put them out of the way off the sidewalk. Right, but is there like clubhouse in that block or something? A clubhouse? I mean, is, is that a destination for people with, with Maybe. scooters? I mean, if you take away a spot and the business says, okay, that's going to hurt me a tiny fraction of a bit, and all you do is paint some lines out there and maybe you attract three or four moped people because they like it, maybe that's a good offset. I don't know. What I mean, about I motorcycles? Can they park there? Um, I think the ch that, that's a great question. I think the challenge with motorcycles might be is that I think they still have to pay for parking, right? And so how do you... I mean, you can, you can make it a motor motorcycle parking spot only um, and then it would capture its plate and everything just for one motorcycle. But 
That's, I mean, it's a good question. I don't, yeah. I just know there's an extra complication versus mopeds typically and, and electric scooters and things like that typically being no charge and a motorcycle being a charge for use. So it's a good question. Yeah, I think this is like super micromanagement and probably don't think I'm gonna go for this, but. No. I mean, in my opinion, in my opinion, the way I look at it is you're taking away two spots and you're just saying, make that other spot something fun and different as opposed to just having it, you know, my, my main drive is to keep the visibility there with two spots because the people that use it most often know that it needs to be two. But instead of just keeping it in an open space, why not get creative and paint some stripes on it? It doesn't hurt anything. Commissioner Cole? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, Commissioner Douglas, I actually disagree. I don't think this is micromanagement. It's policy. I mean, we're talking about how, what, what we want the road to be and how we want it to look. And, you know, this is, on the grand scheme of things, you know, this is kind of starting a discussion about a non motorized plan in the city, too. You know, we're looking, we're starting here. This is a, uh, Commissioner Macy solving the problem of two spaces. You know, that's, we don't often get people come out talking about uh, the parking report at the city commission level. So when you have someone come out and advocate, you know, it's uh, important to someone. Uh, there's a large population there and um, this increases sight distances to what is recommended by MDOT, not, not necessarily required, but the best practices. Um, we're adding a second space and it's finding a creative use for the second space. And I think that's, that's what's really important here. We're, we're solving two problems um, and potentially giving people someplace to go for the second one, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the most important thing here. Um, you know, also I'll point out, <clears throat> when you continue to read these minutes, um, Rick Karlowski uh, resigned from this committee this week. So there's an open spot. Um, I would encourage people, especially someone who um, is passionate about non-motorized transportation to apply. So we have more voices on the uh, traffic committee that are advocating for bicycle and uh, um, pedestrian safety. Any other discussion on 60? Commissioner Hunt? Thank you. Um, my concern is about compliance with that second spot in the event. So um, in Michigan, four to six months out of the year is going to be slushy, rainy, snowy. Is there a way during that winter months, uh, you know, people are going to drive by, see there's not going to be a moped there, there's not going to be a bicycle there, so they're just going to park there. Is there a way of blocking that off during the nasty months to keep park cars from just parking there or shortening it so that cars, cars can't park there? That's a great question. I think what might make the most sense here, so for that first parking spot, we'll be, we paint the curb yellow, right? So people know they can't park there. I think what you, we do is we extend it enough into the second spot where a car couldn't reasonably fit there, but you could still mm -hmm. probably get several moped spots because those I think are only three or four feet wide. Um, so we could still use that space for moped parking, but it would be pretty obvious that a car can't fit there. My first solution off the top of my head anyways. Sure. That's a really good point that I didn't think about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Macy? That is a really good point. I didn't think about either. But luckily, Ms. Donnie, you can come up with things on the fly like that. Um, so, <laughs> Commissioner Douglas, so I totally agree this is very random. Um, and I guess my urge is to, is to get rid of that second parking spot. Um, and I think Commissioner Dubai summarized it pretty well. Like, I think this is a unique spot and having gone out that spot and thinking if I were a resident there, like how challenging it is to get out. Um, but I sort of was on the split the baby fence on how we could maybe still make that useful space, which is why I was saying maybe short-term parking. But Ms. Donahue pointed out that that really doesn't solve the problem. So to me, this is just getting rid of those two spaces, but still finding some utility for our possibly residents. And maybe you're right that there's not a lot of them, although I, I agree. Uh, with um, the mayor, it's not it's not my bag, mopeds, not my thing, but I've definitely seen them, <laughs> I've seen them all over the place. Uh, and I think there was sort of an ex explosion in growth of those over the pandemic. So I don't have no data on that. That's just my observation as well from sitting on my back deck. Well, I've said my say. Okay. Anybody else on 60? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. All right. Right. Those opposed? No. All right. Motion passes. All right. Well, we got some recommendations here from the Citizens Traffic Committee for the rest of them. Uh, Commissioner Colo. I just actually want to ask a question before we keep on going about 6D. And um, <clears throat> I know Commissioner Macy touched on this a little, but Ms. Arnie, you, um, you, I, I think Commissioner Macy, you talked about like a traffic signal, right? The green light that... C. 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 I'm sorry. C. 
um, the green light that's always on, except when someone pushes it. Was there any thought about the flashers that we've put in at different crosswalks across town? The uh, ones that are activated um, by push button? The traffic committee did not uh, discuss whether to do it or not to do it. Uh, we did just, after they had voted, they kind of brought it up as, uh, maybe, that could be, you know. Um, I, as I, I think I say this every time, they make me nervous. I think they give pedestrians a false sense of security mm -hmm. that everyone will stop for them. And the, especially with kids, it makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but it does provide more visibility. There's certainly pros there. Um, they're, they're not super cheap. I think we spent around 25 grand when we did them up at Durham mm -hmm. and Normandy. Uh, I think it was last year. Um, so, you know, not, not nothing. Uh, it's a pretty significant upgrade. Um, but, but yeah, ultimately their vote was just to stick with the standard pedestrian crossing thing. Okay. And then do you have any thoughts about the staff recommendation was, if I recall, Marywood and then uh, traffic man went with Edgewood. C can you give us some pros and cons of the two different locations? I think Edgewood is a perfectly valid location. It really is more okay. of a midpoint. I, I was trying to maybe save a buck here because we already had ramps at the one location. Gotcha. It's, it's That's not all worth you know, if, if there's a better location, we should do it there. Um, it is further from that signalized crosswalk at Washington, so I think you'll see more people using it at Edgewood, um, and that, that seemed to be what the committee felt as well. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, Commissioner Cole? That's all I have. All right. Any motions? Commissioner Fersh? I'll move approval of the remaining traffic committee recommendations. Motion by Commissioner Fersh. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. All right, discussion. All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. All right, thanks, Ms. Donahue. Excellent job as always. Makes life a lot easier for us when we have one of the state's best engineers. Unfortunately for you, you have a commission that's very creative, so therefore it makes your job really hard. All right, this brings us to item nine, which is the presentation of the Commission for the Arts 2021 annual report. And I see the wonderful, amazing Ms. Jody Ellison here you to can present. Keep going, that's good. It's you know it's a good night when you're here. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm happy, happy to be here. Happy and honored, actually, to be here to present for the Arts Commission. And the only reason I am here is because my chair could not be. So as the vice chair, it falls to me. Um, you will have received, I believe, copies of our annual report from Ms. Barkman. And um, I'm just going to do a really quick overview, give you guys some points, take questions, and keep this as brief as possible. Um, our mission, as you know, is to support and promote arts in Royal Oak uh, culture as well in the community. Um, we, like many other commissions in the city, did have a pandemic pause, and because of the nature of what we do, it did affect us, but we did keep going with several of our programs. We have relicensed uh, several of our Art Explored pieces, uh, the main ones, the big ones. The uh, license agreements have already been signed. Those have gone back out. If you've been at the library, you will see that Share the Warmth is out again, and the uh, the chair of that subcommittee, uh, Denise Reske, says that she's refilling it all the time. Those pieces are going and they are hopefully going to people who need them and can use them. Um, summer concerts were stopped. Obviously, we need to start uh, arranging for the concerts for the artists early in the year. And we were not prepared last February or March to say yes and to go ahead with concerts. So we did decide to just hold them for this year. Hopefully next year, if things slow down, we will start our summer concert series back up again. Uh, let's see, new Art Explored, Artist Laureate pieces also we hope to have coming in 2022. As you may know, our first Artist Laureate piece, the beautiful mural that is outside in City Hall, um, they were, I believe, given 18 months to, from start to finish on that and COVID hit. So they've been able to really develop that beautiful piece. And uh, I don't think we'll be able to give that much time to our next laureates, but, but at least we know what can happen when the time is there. Uh, one wonderful thing that the, um, 
the uh, office did, the assistant to the city manager's office did, was put together a community survey. And the results of that survey showed strong support for continued arts in the community, as well as interest in seeing arts in more places around town. Now, with those points in mind, some of our 2022 goals, the overriding goals, we want to work on becoming a more sustainable committee. We hope that we will be micromanaging less and less as time goes on, that we will have procedures in place, and that whoever takes over after we fulfill our tenures will be able to continue the programs and start new ones and, again, keep them sustainable. We want to build collaborative and community based art programs. Interactive art, we feel, is very important, not just with professional artists, but with students, with uh, other citizens. We want the whole community to come together supporting art in, in Royal Oak. We are working on identifying local artists to provide better support for them and for our programs. If we, again, work together, we get more art, and that's a win. We are developing art requirements, hopefully, for future public buildings. And we would also like to encourage them to continue in our existing public buildings. Again, with, uh, with the building that was going on and COVID restrictions, we didn't really get a chance to address much of that while the city center was being built up. But we do know that there are existing places where art could be positioned in the buildings or outside the buildings. And those are things that we hope to continue to work toward over the next few years, uh, definitely in 2022. And we also want to improve communication and outreach to Royal Oak residents. One thing that is very important to us is listening to our residents, hearing what they have to say, hearing what they want, where they want it, and then trying to make it happen as far as the arts are concerned. And with that, I will happily take any questions that you might have from for the Arts Commission. Questions? Commissioner Douglas. Ms. Allison, and I know this question is one we ask both of your group of volunteers and of the city staff, if the summer concerts return, do we anticipate they will take place in Centennial Commons? You know that is one of the things that we talked about. And we don't know. Um, we've obviously established the precedent of having them at Eagle Plaza. Um, we see detriment to that area. It's it's a it's a closed space. You can only get so many people. I do believe that people would love to see the concerts happening at Centennial Commons. I think it's a perfect location for it. We not only have the stage, but we have the viewing hill. We could you know, use the library steps, perhaps. Um, so with some discussions of AV, audio audiovisual and, and sound uh, uh, requirements, I would like to see it, and I do think that that is, is one of the goals of the commission as well. Cool. Me too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Bruch? Um, not a question, um, because Jody has presented an excellent summary of our work. But I can say for sure, as the city commission representative on this commission, that it, it was a very, very, very frustrating period of time to not be able to meet especially knowing and understanding that during the pandemic, um, accessibility to the arts and arts programs could provide so much relief and, and, and that to people who are suffering all different types of, of separation or isolation or you know, lack of ability to do a lot of other things during the pandemic and, and we couldn't have a part in that. And that was extraordinarily frustrating. So we're approaching this coming year with a great deal of enthusiasm and pent up energy. You know, like, like, let's get the, hit, the ground running and, and develop not only the existing programs and get them back on their feet, but I'll also develop new ones as well. So it, for us, it's very exciting to be back meeting re re regularly again, um, st uh, starting out some programs like the Artist Laureate program again after the first of the year, looking forward to the summer concerts. Um, also looking at some things like we have mentioned in the past, and the city commission of course approved um, the 10 by 10 uh, restroom building in the park. Um, that of course was not part of the original design of the park because it doesn't really fit with the original design of the park, having a little square building there. Um, but the arts commission is a little excited about the possibility of being asked to think about ways that they could perhaps make that a little bit more conform with the natural aspects of the park, using their creative talents as an art commission and knowing the artists in the community. 
Uh, people have said, you know, just throw a bunch of bushes around it, but on the other hand, uh, there's an opportunity there for a really creative person to make it a real um, key element in the park rather than just a 10 by 10 bird building. So we're looking forward to getting back on our feet in the coming year and, and moving forward with a lot of these projects and engaging with the broader artist community in the, in, in the city, which is huge. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty darn excited. Exactly, and, and we're also, we're fortunate to have um, one of our committee members is an art teacher, an elementary art teacher. She started a new program for us during the pandemic that she's hoping to develop and expand as we move forward of online, um, uh, she, she was actually doing really cute little clips with her two-year-old um, projects that families could do together if they wanted to, wow. that anyone anyone could do with found materials type of thing. And so hopefully we're going to expand that, potentially move into some webinars and some other things that, you know, if, if things don't open up as quickly as we would like them to, we can still engage the populace, we can still bring them in and give them an outlet, like Commissioner Perouche said, and move forward with, you know, it's, it's so important to have that therapy for people mm -hmm. who are creative types to let them have an outlet. Very nice. Mr. Macy. <clears throat> yes, this is great. I, um, I was looking forward a little bit. If you could just broad strokes tell me a little bit more about how the Artist Laureate program is going to get going, like what the timeline looks like and what the process. What I'm specifically wondering about is when they um, apply or whatever, mm -hmm. to get, go through the process, do they have in mind a certain project that they want to bring to the city, or is that something that happens afterwards, after the selection? Because we've only had one. Um, it's it's still a bit in development. I believe what we did. Am I humming or is it just? Am I hearing a song? I hear a song. Um, anyway, uh, because we have only had the one, it is still a program in development, and uh, we encouraged the artists the first time to do something that would speak to Royal Oak, that would bring in maybe the story of Royal Oak, or that would relate to residents, which as was obviously the story of the mural. So they may not have an exact um, project, but we want at least the guidelines. We want to know, because it's a larger prize, it's a bigger program, usually a longer time period. And so how are you going to take the money that is given to you, the support that is given to you, and develop it into a project that maybe you've been wanting to do, that gives back to the community, that also you then can speak to groups, you can speak to student groups, you can speak to scout groups or, or civic organizations, and explain to them your process, explain to them the history of the project, get more people interested, and potentially, uh, like with the mural, one of the, one of the aspects that we had been hoping for was that there would be some more hands-on with community members, and that wasn't able to happen. But the artists themselves do so much with um, mosaics, where they bring in community, community members, that down the road, as former laureates, we may be able to tap back into that once things relax a little bit and calm down. So I don't know if that answered your question. Okay, good. Commissioner Bruch. The way I understand, whoops, it go, it's finicky tonight. Um, the way I understand the laureate program based on the guidelines that we developed is that fundamentally in all of their, in every application that we get, they have to in some way involve the broader community. They just can't paint a painting and say, you know, I'm gonna put this up on the city hall wall. They have to develop some kind of a project that involves the broader community in some way. And it doesn't have to be an artistic rendering like the mural is. It can be, it can be music, it can be um, performance, it can be any type of artistic expression. But it has to involve the broader community more than just a creation of their own that they give to the community. Um, that community aspect to it. And there's no, you know, it has to involve 500 people. There's no hard and fast guidelines that way, but it definitely has to involve the broader Royal Oak community rather than just a single creation on their own. That's the fundamental part of it. Okay, anybody else? 
Awesome. All right, Ms. Ellison, it's always a, a vote of confidence when you get so many interesting questions uh, <laughs> about the excitement. I know um, when we first put this together, you've been a part of uh, the Commission for Arts for uh, since its inception, and, and uh, you've done a really good job, you and the rest of the, the Arts Commission, and we're just so grateful for the work that you do because it's one of the things that, you know, we make investments in the community, and that's what this is. Art is an investment in the community. It's not a nice to have, it's an investment, and especially more than ever, after from everything from the events from last week to COVID, um, I think we need you know, more therapy in the form of art uh, than we've considered in the past. It's not an area to cut, it's an area to invest, and it just doesn't take money. It takes the hard work of community volunteers like yourself and others and artists to make this happen, and it's a point of pride and we're grateful for the work you do. And we're looking forward uh, to what's coming next because I, I think you guys have a whole list of creative ideas and um, uh, we're very excited and look forward to the future. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you very much. And we're always happy to take more ideas. So if you have them, you should have said that because I wrote down some notes here. <laughs> you know how to reach me. I, I do. All right. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you Ms. Allison. Okay, that brings us to item 10, which is the approval of the Responsible Contractor Ordinance Administrative Rules. Okay, I see Ms. Barkman, your name's on this, but I don't know if Mr. Brake's going to open it up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor and, and uh, City Commission. What we are presenting to you is this is following up the adoption of the ordinance that was spelled out that the administrative rules would be um, uh, presented for your consideration. So there's, there's two elements of this. Number one is that this is an initial set of rules. So this is a new experience for us and, and um, uh, we hope and anticipate that it'll go smoothly. Um, but at the same time, we need to have the ability to, if it becomes necessary, to, to pivot and make minor little tweaks. And so that, that's along with us. But as mentioned in the, in the ordinance, and what this spells out is information on qualifying projects, the required documentation, and it spells out subcontractor requirements when it is applicable, um, uh, public information, and conditions in which contractors may be added or removed from the responsible or non-responsible um, uh, list. So how complaints are processed, enforcement, and evaluations. So this spells out through, there's two different forms that the bidders will be providing. One is about the company itself, and then two about the project. So you might have where the first form that the, the contractor fills out once and fills out multiples for various projects that they bid on. Yeah. Um, and um, it also allows the contractor, and this is one of the, the concerns that was expressed that a contractor may not readily know who the subcontractor will be. So it does set a timeline uh, that the subcontractors submit the, the appropriate documentation. So the subcontractors, we, we established a floor, if you recall, at the last time this was discussed, that any projects for a sub is at 50,000 or, or, or greater, that they need to uh, uh, complete that paperwork. Then it also spells out timelines of how staff responds to things and, and how that, that flows uh, from, from here. So this is uh, presented for your consideration, but uh, Susan Berkman and a number of Halle Donahue and other staff have, have spent uh, uh, a lot of time, energy, and effort and very thoughtful in putting together the administrative rules. But just to give you an overview of uh, how this will work, and uh, uh, this is presented for your consideration. And again, uh, accepting the administrative rules and giving us the ability of really making minor adjustments if there's anything substantive, of course, that we would bring that back if there's an issue that, that arises uh, during the implementation of these rules. Right, questions for Mr. Bright? Commissioner Dubuc. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so going through this, Mr. Bright, the one yeah. thing that uh, jumps out at me is, um, in addition to our $250,000 cap for a mm -hmm. project or $50,000 for a sub, we're saying that this does not apply to any DDA project or any projects using federal state grant funds, federal or state grant funds, or community development block grant funds. That's a huge portion of our large scale spending. 
on infrastructure projects. I, I don't. I, I'm having a hard time envisioning what's left after that. Well, no, because uh, water and sewer paving. The examples that I gave you are under this commission's purview. Now, things that uh, pertain to state and federal grants, they're very specific in what, what sort of requirements and what restrictions can be placed on them. So th that would be uh, uh, difficult, if not uh, impossible to overcome, or just simply not accept the federal funds. Now, the, the DDA is, they are a separate entity. Uh, the commission can ask the DDA to consider that. But they are a separate financial body, uh, separate from, uh, although the commission approves their budget, they are a separate entity in that regard. And that gets into a legal question that I would defer to uh, Mr. Leal to spell that out. But just making that clear of what the distinction is between those, those different entities. So again, when I gave you the examples uh, 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 last month, again, I was talking about all those water, sewer, paving, sidewalks, those are the chunk of it that, that goes through the, the city engineer's office. So that, that was not implying of diminishing that, that dollar amount. It's pretty significant. So then you're talking specifically about grants, you're not talking about other money that flows from the state like Act 51 dollars? Correct. So, so Act 51's where we're doing construction as a result of that, the responsible contractor would apply. But if there is a, say for instance, and this is why I have to, to look at Ms. Donahue, I think if there's a TAP grant, if there's a very specific narrow purpose of a grant, this would not apply. Because a lot of times TAP grants flow through the federal government, that go through the state. And um, uh, th those are very, very specific. But, but just the broad, what, what you pay at the pump, that comes to us, those are, are under the jurisdiction of the city and the responsible contractor would apply because it's road projects that we anticipate that this would be most applicable towards. Okay, and ARPA dollars is a federal appropriation, not a grant. That would be subject to some, uh, I guess, legal interpretation mm -hmm. because at this point, ARPA is falling under that these are, um, uh, what do you call, not temporary, but that's uh, uh, guidelines that are still under review have not been finalized. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say absolutely that it could not apply in that instance, but uh, if there are contract requirements that are required under the federal government, it may preclude this, but you're asking a good question. You know, we haven't gotten that far into say, you know, if we're going to be constructing something out of those those dollars. So, I mean, can we just maybe instead of I feel like we're kind of making a blanket statement here, where sometimes the rules around the grant or the law um, may prohibit us from enforcing mm -hmm. our policy. Can we put a qualifier here saying in cases where um, the money is restricted? the restrictions of the dollars prevent us from enforcing our policy? I would say yes, but I'll, uh, you're asking a legal question, so. You can certainly do that, and then uh, there's not a problem with adding that language if you want. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to put us in a position where our default is we're gonna do it unless it is clear we cannot. All right. Yes, so that, that would be all, right. all right, thanks. Uh, I think I have Commissioner Perush and then Commissioner Polo. I don't have any problem with that suggestion, um, except to the extent that it, it qualifies the downtown authority funds. I mean, the, under the state statute, a DDA is a separate municipal corporation. And granted, you know, we're kind of linked in certain ways, but they're, they're far more independent legally than perhaps we're used to because we, walk, we cooperate so effectively with ours. Um, but they are a separate legal corporation, and I don't think we have any authority legally to impose this on them. I mean, we can certainly suggest it, but I don't think we can impose it or require it on our own. Commissioner Colo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the same paragraph that Commissioner DeBuck talked about, there's something that says any maintenance project of any amount. Um, and that kind of gets me because in the original ordinance, we talk about repair being qualified, that this qualifies under repair. Repair and maintenance are essentially the same thing, right? 
Um, so I guess that I would want to take out the maintenance project of any amount also. Um, a cracked sidewalk, that's we're maintaining the sidewalk by fixing the sidewalk. Um, painting a building, replacing a roof, patching a roof, those are all maintenance projects that would be excluded under these rules, which I think is probably against the, the spirit because we deliberately included repair inside the, um, the ordinance when it passed a month ago. And maybe I'll just add to that question. I mean, my opinion on here is any maintenance project of any amount, that to me raises red flags to me why we have that in there because if projects costing less than $250,000, what sort of maintenance projects do we have that are over $250,000 and why are we trying to exempt them? So, if, if you recall back oh, to the yeah. original presentation, if I may respond, what I suggested to you, we're, we're venturing into a new territory. Mm -hmm. And so we go through a cycle in, in construction, we know that, that that part is predictable. As we get better versed at, at implementing this program, and I, what I promised you is that we'd come back and we'd broaden this. And we can look at different dollar amounts. So at this point, it was meant as, and it was very specific about this, uh, clear in the context of construction projects. Because I, I gave you a parameter. If you remember, I, I mentioned the number of projects, the dollar amount, and it's, it's a fair amount of work that, that, that's out there. In order to adhere by the, the timeline, here's, here's what I'm concerned about, is that if we get into a situation where there is a repair that's, that it's an emergency that we need to do. Is this something that are we going to let uh, that, that what, what is happening to further exasperate the, the, the problem? Again, as, as we get better at this, again, what I emphasize to you is that we need to crawl before we walk. And we're going to have a fair number of construction projects that will be very well versed at this. And then we'll, we'll come back through and, and broaden that parameter. Um, just a, a, a Commissioner first one thing, I just because I want to keep that train of thought here just real quick. I mean, I understand that. I just ha am, you know, and I get the fact that we want to be able to be reactive for repair. Mm -hmm. This is maintenance, and maybe it says any emergent, maybe we change it to something that says any emergency project that's required at mm -hmm. the discretion of the city manager and city engineer, meaning like if there's a huge water main break and someone's got us in a corner and we have to approve $251,000 or whatever, I mean, you know, that's an emergency, um, you know, and we just use our discretion on what an emergency is and what isn't. But if not, it can, I think the right medium here is, especially with the, well, one, if the DDA doesn't apply, then we just mm -hmm. shouldn't purposely exclude it in here. It just doesn't apply. And if it does later on, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, we'll take that legal argument when the DDA has projects, okay? I just don't think we want to exclude it. Uh, in words, because that's just binding us to something that, if it's already prescribed by law, then why put it in here? Or if there's a debating opinion, why come back and change it? Just leave it out completely. Um, and then um, with the federal funds, state funds, and all of that, in the event that there's an issue, then it can mm -hmm. be brought to the city commission for you know remediation for our decision, if there's a good reason not to follow it or whatever it may be. And then for maintenance and repair, I would say that the only reason why would be for an emergency. If we get somebody that only bids on one thing and they don't meet this criteria and we only get, you know, we can't get any bidders, then you come to us and say, we can't get any bidders and we'll say, okay, well, we'll relieve the rules for this situation. I think that's what the spirit of what we're trying to do. We realize that okay. will happen, but mm -hmm. we just like, we want it, the default to be this. And then if there's an exception, we manage the exceptions. Um, I have no problem giving you the authority. You know, you gotta do a re repair and it's expensive and you can't wait two weeks for the next commission meeting, do it. You know, okay. um, right. but you know that should be reserved for emergencies, not like oh we're going to get into a multi-million dollar maintenance agreement with so and so, and we we're planning it over three months, and you don't talk to us about it. You know, there's a difference. So okay, all right, we will try to make that work. But again, it, it's you know, it's what I emphasize to you is that we want this to be successful. Right. And so I think by gaining some experience of, of going through this, and some of the peers, some of the other organizations that we compare ourselves to have a professional purchasing department. We have a purchasing clerk that's in the finance department and, and not to diminish. So we, we just need to, to look at staff capacity. That, that's my only caution in, in that regard.
Commissioner Peru, sorry. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, along the lines of the of the DDA, what about the library? The library is kind of quasi independent. They do their own contracting for for a number of projects, as I as I understand it. Um, are they going to be subject to this policy, or because of the way the library statute is, and they operate under that, are are they? Do they have to adopt this? Can we impose this on them? I don't. I'm just asking. I, that just occurred to me that they're they're kind of like a DDA. They're kind of quasi independent, and set their own policies. So I don't have an answer to that. We may not have an answer for that tonight. I would say we probably would need to research that and, and to come back with you. I, honestly, it would not be that often um, because they they probably don't, do not. I have that many large construction no, projects. absolutely not. And yeah. they've done so much recently oh. that they've kind of got a lot of things finished. Correct, so, right, right. And a lot of stuff that they're doing now is being done by the DDA in terms of the terrace and the new entrance right, right. and so on. So, but just for future mm -hmm. reference, maybe that's something we ought to take a look at and decide okay. whether or not we can, or impose it or whether we should suggest it to them. Yeah, and it, I fully anticipate uh, there will be issues that we, part of the, the saying that I hear frequently is we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to be willing to be adaptive and to recognize, certainly I think it would be logical to bring this back a year from now. And if nothing else, just do a check-in. How are we doing? How's this working out? This is the intent. And, you know, applaud our success stories and, uh, and talk about where, where the shortcomings are. And if there are bidders that Ms. Donahue is not able to uh, get to participate or to solicit, then, then let's discuss that. So it's, it, it's not a perfect system. So uh, I would say be patient with us, but uh, uh, clearly uh, we want to put us in the best possible position and where it's in a manageable environment. And, and based on that, then we can expand that to encompass there's other elements that we can include in the future. One, one hint to maybe explore is I know we had in the budget to hire a facility manager. Um, you know, a lot of these things, you know, especially maintenance and repair kind of pop in there. Maybe that's a, a dual responsibility where you're half facility manager, half purchasing agent, you know, for big projects and stuff like that. Something to think about, um, you know, mm -hmm. in order to, to do this. But I, I, I think, um, you know, and I think we also, to your point, Mr. Brake, there's going to be a learning curve. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally, I don't know how the rest of the commission feels, don't have an issue that if we run into a, a you know, we take the default position that everything should apply, maybe a few emergency things just because we don't have a gate. And if you have to bring things back to us, I think that's part of our learning process too. So I don't have a problem with you guys saying, hey, we have to do this contract for this whatever. These are the issues we ran into. Right. Let's talk about them versus saying, you know, pre-qualifying all these things that don't apply, and then, you know, we just kind of move on to the next topic du jour. So I don't, I mean, this is important enough, I think, mm -hmm. for this commission that we don't mind taking the time to work through those quirks when they pop up, especially in the first year. So I think making it more restrictive actually provides us that benefit to, to think about it, because we're not doing this for a year. This is something that we hope will be here for generations. Right. So. Okay. Commissioner Macy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done going back like 10 minutes in this conversation, but I wanted to go back to ask uh, Commissioner Proust a question about um, the DDA. So <clears throat> I understand what you're saying about it being separate and we can't bind them by this for their own projects, but I was reading this to be like, let's say we have a project that's $250,000 and they contribute $25,000 of that. Are you saying that we couldn't, we couldn't use this in that case? Because I, I thought, I would have thought that we could, but I... I, in my view, you could because it would be mm -hmm. right. would be our contract okay. that they would be contributing to. So it's not. I don't think, at least in my view, it doesn't mean that any time there's a contract that DDA money touches, you can't use this. Because I think fundamentally, what we're talking about, at least in your example, is that it, it's a city contract that the DDA is contributing a certain amount of money to. And to me, in that situation, these would apply. Okay, great, thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Cole. Um, so going back, I guess, now 15 minutes in the conversation, before that, the discussion about the emergency um, maintenance and repair, we, we actually included that already too, correct, Mr. Break? If you look at the definitions, um, we called out emergency, <coughs> except repair and emergency situations. So that's, that's something that's written into the, 
the ability for the city manager for mm -hmm. the department is already written into this um, the document as we started. So I can move approval of this document with removal of the second and fourth bullet points on page three. Motion by Commissioner Colo. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. All right, discussion? I think we discussed it out. Uh, Commissioner Newbuck, I know you had your hand on something previously, but. Sure, I and mean, regarding the motion, I guess, I think if we remove the second bullet, uh, that I leaves a lack of clarity in cases where it's clear that the fund, the funds coming in prohibit us from using this policy. Sure. I think the previously discussed you know, uh, amending of it to recognize that our policy doesn't apply in cases where the law or the restrictions on those dollars would prohibit it, I think is uh, preferable to just removing the bullet altogether because it has to be addressed. I think that sounds like exactly what I said. Oh. When I made my motion. Oh, you did? Yeah. No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> did I zone out? No, no, that's what you wished you said. That's yeah. what you wished you said. Okay. Uh, I'll move to amend the motion as such. Okay, we have to motion. Keep bullet two with that change. Second. As long as the city manager, city attorney understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Move, yeah. seconded. <laughs> We're clear. Okay, any discussions on the amendment? All right, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion amendment passes. That brings the amended motion back. Commissioner Dubot. I had my hand up before that conversation. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I'm absolutely clear on the DDA situation. So uh, the DDA exists at our pleasure, according to state law. It exists at the pleasure of this body, but there is no mechanism for us to inform their fiscal policy whatsoever. The DDA was created by this body or a previous body many years ago, but under the law, they're granted the same authority, uh, many of the same uh, rights and, and duties that this commission has. They're totally separate from this board. There are some re requirements in the state law that require them to come before this board, such as getting their annual budget. But as far as them entering into their own contracts th with the use of the funds that have already been approved on an annual budget, those are their contracts, unless what the relationship has been between the city and the city commission and the DDA and the DDA uh, board, as far as how they go about in, in, in entering the projects together, I do not have that history. I can't answer that. But I, I do know that there are certain parking lots in the city that are jointly owned. Uh, but a, as far as do they serve at the pleasure or, uh, of, this, of this commission, I would interpret their relationship with this city as being a partner in, in, in promoting the needs of, of, of the community. Uh, agreed. Their legal authority stems from state law, but their existence stems from an action of this body. Yes, and from all many members years are ago. appointed yes. by yes, this sir. body. It just seems an odd power dynamic for us not to <laughs> it's, inform it's, their, their fiscal policy in any way whatsoever. We do have representation on that board, correct? That's correct. Uh, and, and so would it be appropriate to, to ensure that this is brought forward as a recommendation to the DDA? Mm -hmm. You can certainly do that and, and pass, and your representative on the board is here to make that pitch to the DDA to see if they would be willing to also adopt this this uh, uh, ordinance via a policy that they would adopt. Okay. You want to amend the motion to add that? Um, we can do it as a separate motion now. Okay, no problem. All right, so we have a motion on the table. Any more discussion on it? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, motion passes. All right, Commissioner Dubuck. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move uh, that we uh, direct the city manager to bring forward this recommendation to the DBA to adopt this fiscal policy. Okay, well, motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? Uh, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, anything left on this one? I'll just, I mean, you know, I, I want you guys to know, mm -hmm. staff, that uh, we hear you. We understand, and I know you're doing the best you can, and this is going to be an evolving creature. So please do not stop or hesitate to say, hey, I'm having a problem. Call me personally. Bring it up to the board when the contracts come up, and let's talk about it and figure out, because we realize there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, and, um, you know, that might be a little bit of effort up front, extra effort to talk about it, but then we can perfect this thing and, and live mm -hmm. up to our values as a community. So we appreciate the effort. We know it's not easy. Uh, we're grateful for the time you're going to put into this and don't be afraid to ask for help or what you need and, and let's have a discussion about it. Thank you. Okay.
All right. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hunt. Um, if we could go back to item number nine, um, I apologize for clarity and for, um, for the minutes. Um, it appears that there was a resolution to oh, be made yeah. on that um, particular <laughs> item. <laughs> you are absolutely correct. Um, we got straight into the presentation and then I scanned down to the mural and uh, we missed that. <laughs> so you know where my eyes were on the pictures. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Farouche. I will make a motion that we approve um, and accept the report of the Commission for the Arts. We have a motion by Commissioner Farouche. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. All right, discussion. All right, with not, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. That brings us to 11, which is approval of Planning Commission recommendation for zoning ordinance text amendments, maximum permitted building heights, second reading. I see the legendary Mr. Twing sitting over there. Mr. Twing. I don't know what I'm legendary for. <laughs> don't ask. Good evening, Mayor, Member of the Commission. Uh, this was before the City Commission in November uh, on first reading. Uh, the only reason it's not on the consent agenda was not a, a unanimous vote at that meeting. Um, it is a recommendation from the Planning Commission uh, to change the uh, maximum height uh, allowed in certain zoning districts. Um, I think I went through them uh, at the November meeting, so unless there's questions, I'll stop and uh, go from there. Questions for Mr. Twain? We hashed it out last time. It's just not on consent because it wasn't unanimous. Commissioner Bruch? I'll move approval of this on second reading. A motion by Commissioner Bruch, second by Commissioner Douglas. All right, any discussion on it? All right, with not a call for the vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes. All right. So that brings us to item 12 which is discussion of proposed sponsorship of Winter Plattis Royal Oak as requested by Commissioner Colo, okay. Commissioner Douglas, and Commissioner Perouche. Um, I don't know how we kick this one off. There's a letter here from Mr. Brake. Maybe you can kind of get the ball rolling, sir. Well, I'm providing information to you that was provided by Mr. Whitson. I know he wants to make a presentation of the, the slideshow attachment and talk about the, the concept here. Um, he's identifying the, the source of funds and uh, expressed some concerns about that, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, to be aware that's of what, what the activities entail, um, what, one of the other side issues initially looked at uh, the, the use of uh, our new Centennial Commons, and so I discussed that with, with Mr. Witz. Uh, we have some additional clarity from uh, the, the contractor that's, that's building uh, the park and finishing up as we're under the, a warranty period and is really not advising of any activity at all and not having any uh, items of any sort of weight or anything like that. In fact, um, our DPS, the public services, will be putting up snow fencing around the, the grass area so that, that shrinks that down even considerably. And that's, that's only for this year because we have brand new sod that's in there and, and plus there's problems with the, uh, the, the cement that's poured that we, we can't use any sort of corrosive sort of salts or, or anything like that. So just to be perfectly clear that, you know, the, this seems like the logical place to to have a large gathering and in um, um, uh, this time next year, uh, I'd say have at it, but until such time um, that's, that's off the table. But nevertheless, uh, Mr. Witz has indicated that, that he could work around that, that location. Um, so th th there's an expectation that the, there's a financial commitment that he's asking uh, that the city make. Um, so being right up front, this is not budgeted. Um, so it's, uh, he's identifying a source of money that we haven't gone through to, to allocate to different projects. 
um, and with a few small uh, exceptions. But nevertheless, we did uh, lend some support to the arts, eats, and beads. I suggest that as he's doing additional fundraising, the looking at leveraging additional sources, and, and hopefully there's there's other funding partners that can help uh, put this together. So the the concept I know is organically uh, gaining a lot of enthusiasm and support, um, and he will relay that through his presentation. But uh, to kick off the, the conversation, uh, presenting this uh, for your uh, consideration. Along with that, in the police department ordinarily, we, we review uh, this process through a special event permit and uh, that has not been finalized at this point. So it's a new concept. And um, ideally, it would be better to, if we had uh, an additional time from what I understand when Art Seeds and Beats the very first year, and there was a longer lead time that led up to that. Uh, this isn't quite the, the size and scope of the, the event, uh, but just the same that we will continue to work with the promoter, um, but really looking for what, what your thoughts are, if this is something acceptable and, and hashing out, you know, what, what is that level of support from a financial commitment? Um, and that, that's something that we would have to take into consideration, really needs to be part of the budget in, this, in next year's budget process. And, and, you know, can't guarantee, but, uh, you know, let's we'll, we'll, uh, put that in the mix and, and, and try to make that work the, the best that we can. So, but uh, here we are with an opportunity and, and we would turn that over to the promoter to uh, make that presentation and um, he'll kind of walk us through what's, uh, 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 Richard Wilson is going to, to bring up the slideshow and, and uh, John will, will walk through that verbally and uh, so our audience can see the, the presentation at home uh, along with everyone here in the room. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Mr. Jonathan Witz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before we start, I just want to give a little bit of back, background, uh, if I could. I think some of it might be in the presentation, but I just want to address uh, uh, City Manager Brake's uh, opening comments just to a point. The Arts, Beats, and Eats, when it came to Royal Oak, even though we had longer lead time, it was approved. We had a, a tough deadline, you know, with whether it was going to move or not, and it, it went through the commission in a pretty, pretty quick manner. It's definitely um, not the intention to always have it that way, but it's also not the intention to miss out an opportunity. Uh, before we brought this to uh, commission members and the city, there was a, a meeting uh, with Acting Chief uh, Moore, now uh, Chief Moore, uh, prior, there was a discussion with uh, stakeholders in the area. There was a thorough review of the layout and a layout put together. And there certainly, as Mr. Brake said, there was a conversation related to the park and adjustment there. Um, we have a situation where we've had an event that was kicked off as part of Super Bowl. It has a huge legacy you know, for the region. It, uh, there was a trial run in 2005 in Detroit before Campus Martius uh, truly took off. And one of the reasons why the event continued after Super Bowl is the year before Super Bowl, when there was a winter event, a lot of people thought, oh, there's no way this is going to work. We actually had 12 inches of snow on the first night, and we ended up having just insane amount of crowds. There was an absolute demand for a a major winter event and Super Bowl hadn't happened yet. So the, the preview of the event in 2005 led us to think that we could continue it. And, and we continue that you know, to great success in fanfare in Detroit. Over the last, uh, due to COVID, our, our advancing on stakeholders and sponsors has been such, on such a tight window to look so far ahead with this, uh, you know, with things being so up in the air, as you know, and you talk about quick decisions, a lot of what my presentation is going to be is just track record and history, and this event has had huge success. 
and we were faced when the governor opened things up, just to give her one example, we had rock and rides that was scheduled for September that in three weeks notice, we turned it around, we met with the city and, and pulled that together and, and, and took care of it. And we had just a, an amazing success that was far greater than last year. So I think there's a lot going on that with timelines that we've demonstrated time and again that we've been able to you know overcome that with good planning and good experience and good relationships and you know just to get to the end of this point when we did our funding rounds in detroit later in the game we ran into you know ran into some issues we have never you know specifically tried to pedal or push or promote or sell this event into another uh community uh we it was born in Detroit and our intention was, you know, to have it there uh, and some of the funding sources around the park were not there and the expense level at the park was overwhelming that we could not make it work. And we would thought it was a shame to see, you know, one of the top regional events in Detroit go away with the success of outdoor events uh, recently. And I thought there was an amazing opportunity to bring it to the city of Royal Oak based on our history based on the effect that this could have in a slow weekend. So um, it was a short timeline, but I, I do think that we have the tools to create some major magic in February. So I will go to the screen and, and, and just try and go through this deck, which I think you've seen as quickly as possible. So um, we can continue to the next one. Thank you. And to the next one, I touched on that. The attractions of this event are significant. Um, there is a slide. We went to a winter slide from a snow slide due to some of the warming temperatures we've seen with global warming and some of the things that the snow slide has been on the edge of being successful to pull it off every year. And we sense that we could have a failure. So instead of for the last two years at Winter Blast, we created a tube slide that in an urban environment was amazing. And what's interesting, the tube slide actually had more participation, more kids went down the tube slide than the snow slide. So it takes kids faster, it's easier, and, and we don't have to worry about weather. And with the snow slide, you're spending $80,000, and if you, ha if you don't have three days of 28 degrees, uh, below or better, you're not going to get it done, but you're already committed to the snowmakers, the scaffold, and all the things. So we went to something we could count on. Uh, there's a beautiful ice sculptures. There's a kid stage uh, during the day in a heated tent that turns into an adult stage at night. Um, there is uh, a ski hill uh, in partnership with Mount Brighton. So instead of having to do 2,000 uh, tons of snow, we only go with a 15-foot slide with a lesser slope which does not need as much snow making uh, and and that has gone great where we can teach uh, kids and folks that have never skied before they mount brian brings out a lot of instructors and they build this hill with their snow machines and it's just been you know just a great time you know to have that and deliver the element of snow uh, we have uh, buskers including fire jugglers and uh, and, and, and other magic and uh, hula hooping and other fun kind of sites that just add to the atmosphere of a street festival. There's marshmallow roasting. I mentioned the heated tents. There's several food trucks. And there is an ice skating rink. So Royal Oak does not have an ice skating rink. So part of our proposal is to put an ice skating rink in the west parking lot of the farmer's market. Uh, not only for winter of last weekend on February 4th through 6th, but to leave the, the skating rink in the farmer's market for the next three weekends to run Thursday through Sunday, so to have four days of skating and see what does the skating rink look like in the city. It's a great opportunity for the commission and city staff to see, hey, is this, is this a keeper? Should we bring it out earlier? Should it be in the farmer's market? Could it be in a different location? It's just a great way to touch and feel skating. And what we are proposing, Winter Blast has always been a weekend where folks could skate for free. So we're proposing that Royal Oak residents, because of the support of the commission, get to skate for free for the entire month of February. And folks from outside the city would pay a fee to help support staff. Uh, so that I think is great. The farmer's market specifically said that they are excited about it if the commission's excited about it. So I think they are in line. That was the uh, quote from Shelley there. And, and, uh, and again, the 44 parking spaces on the west are easily uh, supported by 
the new 750 spaces and other spaces that have come into the area. So highlights, uh, next slide. Uh, four through six, I mentioned a 16-year track record. One interesting thing I will mention is the event actually generates more media coverage than Arts, Beats, and Eats because there is no events going on in the wintertime. Arts, Beats, and Eats competes with six different Labor Day events. There is no other major outdoor regional event. There is the Plymouth Ice Spectacular that has had a lot of issues because of weather and warmth and not always having things where they want them to be, but as far as a major event, um, this has been the major outdoor regional event where you might have 200 events in the summer, you have one in the first quarter, and, uh, and this, is, this is the big one. And one other thing about temperature, one of the interesting things about winter blasts is we actually have had our busiest crowds when there has been 50 degree weather. In the Campus Martius rink, as well as the rink that we would bring in, you can actually skate on it up to 55 degrees. So it's, it's not hampered by weather and people want to come out and be in a festive atmosphere. Certainly the ice will melt, but you can still roast marshmallows. It's cooler at night. People want to hear music and they want to be outside. So uh, warmth does not uh, hurt the event. Uh, next slide. We would work with the DDA to distribute shopping vouchers, similar to what we did for Arts, Beats, and Eats. The events and sh would showcase and promote kind of the district of the park and start getting people comfortable with a festival around the park. Again, how does it feel? How does it feel to have the streets closed? How does it work? It's a great opportunity to work with uh, Chief Moore and, 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 how, and how the crowds work and how the, the, the touch and feel and the, the gates and all that, and all that works. And to Mr. Brake's point about, you know, full use of the park next year, you know, our goal was just to put the marshmallow roasting and the ice sculptures in the park this year. So there is street space, you know, to accommodate that. But man, I think you, in 2023, the use of the park, I, I think this thing will, will just be incredible. Even, you know, just, just really amazing. So excited to have the space, you know, at our disposal in year two. The city would now be home to two of the top 10 uh, publicized festivals, but again, the, the manageability of this event, to give you an example, the crowd size is probably one eighth of Arts, Beats and Eats, but still, you know, 50,000 people. And the alcohol sales is less than 5% of Arts, Beats and Eats. So you are not talking about as much of a alcohol consumption, a little more family driven, and again, in the evenings, we have two small tents for people to enjoy bands versus bigger outdoor areas. So people will funnel into bars and in restaurants naturally. Uh, there are a lot of benefits um, that I'm not gonna go through uh, specifically. Um, I do, there are a couple pictures of the skating rink. Um, I will go through, yeah, we'll come to the benefits. I think the pictures of the skating rink are before the recognition benefits. If we go back, uh, after, yeah, back the other way, other way. Keep going, keep going. Uh, keep going, keep going. So that's just pictures of what the rink would look like. That's from a rink set up in Ohio. We would add some lighting, we would have a sound system there so there'd be music and that just gives you a picture of what the rink would look like. Um, and then go to the recognition benefits on the next page. There'd be signage, um, we'd do an ice sculpture, which could be with the city's logo or the DDA logo or both, or a city sculpture. We could do, you know, a statue in the park or the, anything in ice that would be a fun, you know, situation. We have the ability to sculpt that in ice and recognize the city that way. There's uh, radio, television inclusion, media interviews uh, with city staff and representatives. And then there's the publicity, which again, I think bringing 50,000 people into the downtown on one of the slowest weekends of the year is a huge benefit. And we have a history of those kind of crowds. Um, but the media, the media impressions are significant. They're in the millions of dollars of, of coverage. I have a handout uh, again, and I'm, it's, it's just to, not to necessarily read because you might need your glasses, but if you, I'm just gonna, hand this over and as an exhibit, it just states each of the stories from, you know, from uh, last year. And this is just something to pass around and it just documents each of the interviews and things where the city of Royal Oak would get mentioned and the DDA would get mentioned. And 
and then again we have uh, backups from a company called Sisson that just documents between the last four years between 900,000 and four million dollars of media coverage and you just can't buy it. So, so our ask for the city includes some, some very tangible benefits. One is the media coverage which that amount of money would, would barely get you. There's the impact of the crowds that would be coming into the downtown from an economic impact state, uh, standpoint. There's a quality of life for residents. There is the fact that you have a skating rink and the investment from the city itself would actually almost directly go to the skating rink and the power that supports the skating rink. So there's, uh, I think, a lot of benefits that are right there and tangible. And there is a 16-year six, track record. This is not a new event. This event is recognized, will be well covered, and, uh, and you also have an experienced team that has put on bigger events than this and has put them on on short notice and tight windows, and a team that has worked closely with police, DP, uh, DPW, and, and fire, and has a good planning process and a good track record. The event also, unlike Arts, Beats, and Eats, would be free to the public. So there's no complaint, concern, impingement on businesses, or a concern that someone not, might not be able to get to a restaurant. And we're also not suggesting for this year that there would be a parking additional fee. So everything operates that it normally does and you bring those <coughs> crowds of people into no normal operations, I think it could be a real lift. So thank you. I know I went too long, Mr. Brake, but I tried to tighten it up as much as I could because it is short notice and I want the commission and, and Royal Oakers, you know, to get a, a story on the breath of what an opportunity this is. And I'm ready for, for questions. Questions for Mr. Brake or uh, Mr. Witz? Mr. Colo, or Commissioner Colo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Woods, can you just describe a little bit more how the ice, uh, the ice rink will work outside of the, um, the festival? So the, the ice rink, um, the, as far as not operationally, just, just the, the touch and feel of it or? No, no, just w once the festival's out of town, who staffs it? How, yeah, we how provide all the staffing. It'll be a skate rental tent similar to Campus Marshes. You can go in and, and rent skates. There'd be a fee if you were from outside the city. There'd be a free if you were from the city of Royal Oak. And those, that revenue will cover staffing, it is hoped. It's, we got about a $20,000 budget of, you know, between three and eight people that will work, uh, you know, from a slower time to a weekend. And then there'll be two um, ushers that are on skates that will, when the rink gets opened up after a cleaning, after a Zamboni cleaning, there'll be a, little mini Zamboni machine. The ice would clean every 90 minutes. New people would be able to get on the ice. We'd take a ticket, have a wristband, and then those same people that then admit people skate around from a safety standpoint and make sure it's safety. So it'll be a, yeah, and I think the hours we're thinking are 11, 11 in the morning to 10 in the evening, you know, Thursday through Sunday, maybe close a little early on Sunday. So I think that's the, that's the, you know, the plan you know the idea does that help you yeah trying to get the hours and, and days so that's great that's uh four or five days of free ice skating every week for the month yeah it's four summer. and we technically have two extra days so we could take a wednesday and do a royal oak uh you know staff team day or we could do a school day or a charity day for skating so there would be a couple other skating days that we have because the company that's supplying the rink has to provide some staff and then there's also a power company that provides a chilling unit, which would be the same company that powers the event up and they'll keep that chilling unit, you know, throughout the month of February. And Can the mayor drive the Zamboni? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He will have to be trained and get his Zamboni license. But yes. Commissioner Colo ride on the Zamboni in that sweater and wave at people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then, those, those photo ops might be the revenue source. I did not address the budgeting. Um, I did. I did want to address that uh, from a, a great photo op, just to a budget standpoint. We are bringing in money outside the city. Um, there's a quarter million dollars uh, that either have been committed or are likely to commit. There's the city's money, and then we have it. The city and the DDA support us. There would be ninety-two thousand dollars of additional funding that we also would have to go out and get. And if we were not successful, you know, then we would take the liability 
of that of that additional funding that we that we need to get. So we still have some work to do. Um, again, one of the reasons to try and get approval today versus a meeting in the future, which might be not happening, is again getting the approval today opens a door for proposals to go out. We have an enthusiastic Henry Ford on, on this uh, that is one of them. There is a financial institution that's interested, and and again there is also a mortgage company uh, that is interested as well. And uh, so we are going to hit the pavement if we get everyone's approval to to get this this right. And then from a promoter standpoint, we really are uh, an event uh, producer versus a promoter because there is no gate because of low alcohol sales. There is not really a money making opportunity here. We have a for Jonathan Whitson Associates. There's a fifty thousand dollar fee to manage, operate, sell, uh, advertise, uh, and arrange all of this magic. Uh, you know, uh, over three days, and that's pretty, I would say, low and reasonable. And if we don't, if we don't get the ninety two thousand after, then that fee will get eaten up. Uh, you know, first before we go into a loss further. So there really is not an upside uh, you know, to this event and we are completely open to report and share the budget on this, uh, this event uh, with the amount of support that's coming in on, on short notice. Well, with uh, Commissioner Newbuck and then Commissioner Macy. All right. So am I, I'm looking at and understanding this right. That So I, I see the footprint outline, but this is not an enclosed footprint. It would be well, enclosed, yes. It is enclosed. Yes, it would be just from the liquor license standpoint. Uh, the social district would not would be taken off that weekend, and it would be an enclosed district. District Again, we do want to manage and support uh, spot, you know, sponsor signage and not have drinks come in and out of the event. Uh, a, special, a liquor license can operate with the special events permit. And again, talking to the Royal Oak Restaurant Association as one stakeholder, they have no issue uh, with that whatsoever. And in fact, they're very excited about this event coming, you know, coming to town. Um, but it's just from a perimeter, from a security standpoint, it's just great that we can identify or you know, just keep an eye on who's coming in and out. And the borders of this event would be Troy at 11 Mile, and again, you'd see the skating rink as you're driving by 11 mile. It'd be so dynamic to see people skating as you're coming into the, you know, from I-75 to and from, you know, the event. And uh, again, you'd have a, a ski hill in front of this building. There would be a ski hill right on 3rd Street, which would be hilarious and amazing. You would have a, a giant slide for people that would be coming out of William Street would be landing on a slide. You'd have a, a tent with live music that the folks on Rock on 3rd are just thrilled about having a live music atmosphere tent right outside of their backyard. They feel that people will come flying in and out of their establishment with the bands you know, that are there. So um, you have ice sculptures on 3rd Street. You have this event connected to Main Street. So you know we can... Um, we have a connected domain, so you get touch and feel to many of the businesses that are there. So um, it would be enclosed, uh, but there'd be no admission. Mm -hmm. And again, the parking, I, I suggest we do it this way for the first year, but we can address parking or admission, or if we have too many people, or you know, if there are issues where there is a parking, uh, you know, we, we feel like we should address and monetize this, you know, we, we can work together you know, to make tweaks for 2023. I like the idea of being a you know, more accessible community event. And it has um, been free just to, yes. to, for the last couple of years in Detroit. And so uh, in Centennial, Centennial Commons is part of the footprint, but there is no activity there. Correct. So what we thought to, to discourage, you know, people using the park, we would put no activation in there whatsoever, but it would still be strollable and walkable just like it would be on a given situation. But with all the activities happening outside the park, there's not a specific purpose to go there. So I think that, you know, will ensure, you know, not a big, you know, use of, of the area. In Detroit, when we have an area that's closed off and there's nothing going on a block or a street, people are not gathering there. They're where the music is, they're where the food is, they're where the slide is, they're where the skating is. And again, one of the, the great things about Royal Oak, if we were hit, the worst part of weather is rain. So as we've had at Arts, Beats, and Eats, if we have people there and it starts to rain, where does everybody go? They go into a business. So uh, we have a nice 
a nice rain plan or a win if for whatever reason we have rain. The other thing that is unlikely to happen, but has happened a couple times, two days in our history out of uh, 16 years is we've, we've had cold that was dangerous wind chill, and that has also not been uh, good for attendance, um, even with the heat attendance. <laughs> so we've and had a couple days. I don't want to get too far down the track, well, and you might or might not do, but I just want to get an idea. Are you open to, um, you know, if it's something that we, we want to pursue? We had, we had a lot of really positive feedback from Arts Beats Needs, uh, everyone getting the 10, you know, the first X number of people getting the 10 downtown bucks. Yeah, that's um, done as, as far as, folks. it's not done, I should be careful to say that with uh, uh, um, Mr. Twain here, it's not done, but there's been conversation with proponents of doing that on the DDA who have the dollars, they're in the budget for that program and, have, and are easily made available. So with the lesser crowds at Winter Blast, what our thoughts with the retail bucks are is to take a two or three week campaign leading up to the Winter Blast you know, we and, and send folks into restaurants with the vouchers with an invitation to the winter blast. So, again, when you're trying to promote retail, you want to hit your dining customers. Mm -hmm. So, we would hit dining co customers just like during the day, retail customers should promote dining. So, we were trying to get folks that are comfortable coming into dine to come back and shop. So, our goal is to send ambassadors and put a team together. And this is more of a DDA discussion, but in the two or three weeks leading up to it, is going in restaurants in the evening and send out you know, people just as if they were walking into Winter Blast and being offered a voucher. So um, Winter Blast itself, I think, does not alone have the impact to come anywhere near our speeds and needs. So that's why we want to augment the distribution of those in a campaign two to three weeks in January leading up to it. And the DDA would need to determine, I think the, they're talking about um, having the vouchers be good for longer than the weekend duration, potentially for the month of February, so we can have a a greater impact. All right. Cool. Mr. Macy, we're next. <clears throat> yeah, so this is probably, I think it's probably maybe just a typo or something, but it says it, you have zip line re re revenue listed, but I no, didn't see we, the zip No, we line. don't have a zip line, but that is not out of the question to add. Um, there is an expense on the zip line. So um, there's some revenue from the zip line, but it's, uh, it's another, you know, 10,000, $12,000 risk. Um, so the zip line is possible. We would need to find a little bit more real estate. So um, I'd have to talk to the acting chief and, and uh, a city manager just about potentially using um, uh, Troy from third to fourth. We could probably launch the zip line there, or there could be another location, or have the zip line, uh, zip line operate separately on between main and uh, on third between main and center is another option. But the zip line in the winter is a really cool thing. So it is a typo that it was included, but it is not, it's not crazy because if the sponsorship came through, that could be an add on that would be a lot of fun. And then I think I have a question for Mr. Brake about, about the use of the downtown park. So I understand what you're saying about the downtown park, but it makes me anxious to hear that we don't have a way to keep those uh, pathways clear enough to people, for people to walk on because whether or not it's during this festival, people are going to be walking on that all winter long. Like, How are we planning to keep that clear? Uh, through a couple methods. One is signage to forewarn people. Probably for this event, and this becomes a huge maintenance issue, is we use sand. Okay. But sand makes a mess, and what you put down you have to retrieve. So that, that gets into the devil in the details, but you cannot use, you know, sodium chloride. You certainly can't use salt. Basically what ends up doing it pits the, the cement. Right. So it'll ruin it. Um, again, w once it's, it's fully cured, they use this term of green cement. That's why next year, this time next year, it'll be no big deal. But that, that's, uh, that's an issue that we need to address. And if we put down sand, how, how do you remove it? You just don't push it off into the, the grass, but it would, it would have to be removed after it's placed in the pathway. So we're, we're going to be dealing with that regardless. But, you know, having a smaller, someone just casually walking through the park and if we put signage saying that, you know, you're, you're entering at your own risk is one thing, but to, to have an event where 
you know, because this will be a spillover, you know, that's when you have a large crowd and there's an open area. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, keep in mind, the only parts that anyone would have access to would be the pathways because it's will be the, the where the, the green areas, we're going to be putting up snow fence here sometime in the future to keep anyone from getting on the lawn. So, okay. and, and I guess we would ask as a festival that that we that for sure there would be sand placed down just as I'm sure you would want sand placed down if people were walking in the park because if you didn't have sand down and you just had a sign that said enter at your own risk I think you are asking uh, as your city attorney would probably indicate a tremendous risk just by having that sign and not taking any action possible just for a regular citizen who would be walking through the park I think you would need to have a if you have the chance to put sand down and you don't, I, I'm not sure enter at your own risk would, would help you. I'm, I would be just curious, because we have our own liability with the festival, so I'd be curious what the city attorney's Well, if I may, uh, let me talk about one other maintenance issue, and, and that's not to imply that we're not going to be doing any snow removal. So there are these units where there's these uh, high-powered brushes that are like on a small type of, you know, whether it's a pickup truck or a gator or whatever. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it gets down to the, the surface, but it's just, it, it gets into what Mr. Witz described, if we have a hard rain, that that's that's a whole different animal that we're dealing with here. So, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we also use those same snow removal things. We've used them in sidewalks in Detroit, and we've operated, our crew has operated them as well. So we're comfortable you know, we, we've had that in our own team working on that in Detroit. So yeah, we, we just can, need to be prepared by the event time to see, have our arsenal of options available. And correct. maybe we get lucky, it's a, you know, the gator and the, the wire brushes clean it all out and get sunny days and dry days and everything's good for the festival. Or you get yeah. a ice rain, then you gotta play an audible and throw some sand on there and put some signage up to help people, you know, stay on the path and all of that stuff. There's things we can do. And there's only a 15% chance of snow on an average day in, in, in the winter time, so it's not. Uh, Commissioner Hunt. Thank you. Um, festivals tend to do well in downtown Royale, um, but you, you mentioned that, or average, that about 75,000 people come to the one that, that was in downtown Detroit, which has a much larger footprint than what would be here. Um, I think you said you're anticipating about 50,000 people. How do you get that number and how confident are you that? You mean, are you, you thinking that, are you, are you thinking I'm underestimating it or overestimating it? Overestimating. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm comfortable in the number based on the track record and the amount of media and the coverage just without anything going on, especially there could be more restrictions on indoor activities that this is really an exciting outdoor event uh you know that will be you know that will be going on i would like to if i could you know actually measure the space i'm not sure if it's smaller if you take the campus marshes skating rink itself and put that in the farmer's market which is similar and the tent on the north end and we use the parking lot at rock on third we've really tightened up the winter blast in detroit we use the spokes of the street you have that circular walk i would if i could you know, in very shorter order, I think it would add up to be very similar amount of space. And uh, I would like to check it uh, and get back to you because we're placing in the same activities that we have in Detroit and we don't have too much room. You know, the food trucks are there. Everything that we put in Detroit has a place on the map that we've sent out. So I, I, I think it would be close, but I would like to do the exercise. I wish I, I think it's a good question. I wish I was armed with uh, exact answer, but just my gut from doing this before and having walked the layout in Royal Oak and experienced the one in Detroit, it's, it's, it's tighter. Like the rink in Campus Martius looks small, but it's actually bigger than the rink in, in, uh, in Rockefeller Center. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just interesting, so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually have uh, two questions. Uh, first, from Mr. Woods. Um, Mr. Woods, how much money did Arts Pizza Needs donate to Royal Oak Charities this year? Uh, that number, if you include the parks, uh, the, 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 the money that went back to parks from parking would be over 190000 okay. And to nonprofits themselves, it was over 100000 And I will say, 
we will have Royal Oak nonprofits working the the beverage booths at this event as well. But you know, again, because of the lesser amount of volume, it would probably be more in the five to seven thousand dollar range raised by Roy, for Royal Oak nonprofits. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Brake, uh, you know, I, I noticed here we seem to have a lot of uh, events that either happen east or west of Main Street. Do you think this is something to think about in the future, splitting the social district into two distinct districts so that when we did have an event like this come in, people um, west of Main Street could continue to have their social district open? That's not a question for today, like not an answer I'm looking for right now, just something for you and uh, Mr. Fennin and Chief Mortar to consider. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's still new here, so, yeah. uh, but, okay. So um, with that said, um, you know, I, I'm excited for this event. I'm excited for Royal Oak to win, uh, to get this event here in the city. It's going to bring something to downtown Royal Oak that we just don't have in the uh, wintertime. Um, it's going to bring people a safe place to exist during COVID this year. You know, we have another winter where we're not quite sure what the winter is going to look like. So if we could, we could find a safe way to have residents congregate outside, I'm all for it. I love the fact that we have a skating rink that's available to our citizens for free for an entire month. Um, I'm sure I will fall on it multiple times and my six-year-old would just look and laugh at me if not try to skate over me um, and watch Mary ride the Zamboni on by. Um, so this is a win for the community. So I'm going to move that we allocate $100,000 for the next uh, $100,000 a year uh, for the next two years and for staff to determine the funding source on that. Um, and waive uh, the permit and fees for the use of the roads. And then for staff to figure out the agreement with Mr. Woods. Yeah, motion by Commissioner Cole, is there a second? Oh. Is that a second? No, I had one more questions. I might second a motion at some later time, but I still have a question. Great, the motion at this time fails for support. Commissioner Douglas. So, it, 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 Mr. Colo, uh, Commissioner Colo said this, and, and I'm looking at the, the staff memo, and it talks about the hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and Mr. Witz has proposed, I think, that we take that money from the Ameri the ARPA funds. And the staff's proposal is that um, any ARPA it talks about it in terms of the ARPA funds, not just of funding the event itself. So I don't, I'm, um, I'm not sure why we need any reference to the ARPA grant for your point number two, any ARPA grant will be for the 2022 festival only. And the second part of my question is that this is predicated on Oakland County matching our funds, whether or not that comes from their ARPA dollars or not remains a question mark. So, so Mr. Brake, what is your what is your direction here, or your intent? So, when the the sponsorship came up on Arts Eats and Beats, it went the other direction. It came from Oakland County saying that we're putting this up, predicated that the city manages that. Um, my suggestion is is that we should be looking at leveraging opportunities from other funding sources. That's why I suggested that. Is that a deal breaker? I mean, do we, do we have a reason to believe that Oakland County will match those funds? And is there a timetable by which we would confirm that? Well, I'm, I'm he, best he, to answer that question just because I've talked to the county board chair on it, and those funds are not likely to happen in the time that we would need to hear from the city. Um, those, there's not any movement from the county. There has not been major support from the economic team. Uh, at this kind of level that we're talking about. So just from a recent conversation, I'm not saying it's impossible that it wouldn't work for the city, but in doing our homework, we certainly you know, took that aspect out of our proposal because we also tried to research that to be as collaborative as possible and we were, we're, not, getting the, we're not getting positive feedback um, that this could be ready in, in the timing for this meeting and necessarily in general. So there could be some funding that comes from the county. There is an ask um, that is you know, being discussed, but it's not at this level. And, and, uh, and I think it would, I'm not saying 
you know, um, I guess I'm just saying that from the feedback I have, I don't have immediate good news on that, and it's not to say it couldn't happen uh, as in time, but... But, we, but what you're saying, Mr. Witts, is that if there is something from the county, whether it's 1,000 or 80,000 or 50,000, that would be offset what the city's amount would be, correct? I, I was not saying that. Um, I, I think we could, you know, we, if that was a deal breaker for you, that would be one that we would work with, but we were also, we're trying to, you know, raise the 92, Thousand. What I was asking is if we raise the 92,000 from other sources, then the county money or potentially any source of money could come back to the city if we're successful. And, and there is one company that could come up with the entire 92 as a title sponsor there's a meeting coming up with. So we're definitely willing to work in the language uh, something, but we would we would ask if, for example, we didn't have a title sponsor and we were only running at 20 or $30,000 and the county came in at 20,000, you know, then we are sitting here, you know, actually losing money and not even paying ourselves. So I, we would ask some flexibility, but I think we would absolutely be amenable to work in a clause, you know, that our revenue for sponsorship was tracked against our budget and, and we could absolutely have a give back. And if the city took the position, again, because we are on such a short window here, if, you, if, if I was put in the position where the county money had to go against uh, your money if it came in, you know, I would I would say yes, but I'm explaining why I would ask for a little yeah. more leniency on no, that. No, I just, so. I mean, I think you worded it here. We were working on county investments as well, but in order to move forward, we would need the city guarantee 100,000 or other from our or other sources and 50,000 from DDA. If the county came on board, then the commitment would be reduced. Yes, that was, that was in the, uh, that goes back to the to zip line. There was a, in the scope okay. of, Things happening very quickly and in conversations and looking where we're at. I sent an updated uh, um, ask uh, uh, to uh, Commissioner Bray, uh, uh, Todd Fenton, and Commissioner Colo uh, with, you know, with an outline of something that was a little different than that related to county. But as I said, because we are in a short window, if that is a deal breaker for this body, then you know we would we would be okay with it um, because again there's just no vision on those dollars anyway and we are working on other sources as, as, as yeah, but the answer the so answer I, is it's not to exceed a hundred thousand but there could be other funding come in that could offer some offsets that's, that's so I, continuing <laughs> so you are looking for a hundred thousand dollars from us but that may not be sufficient yes, to carry you over the top correct right and at that point that is on us. That is correct. It would be on that's that's where we would have the liability. We believe that we are building something really special for the future and bringing this event to Royal Oak. We believe that this that the city and the partnership, the future uh, of the park at its full capabilities, will be utter magic uh, for this event that has been you know one of the top events in Detroit for for years uh, bringing it to one of the top downtowns you know in the region is just a recipe for overwhelming success so I believe that in the future after this happens there'll be more support for sponsorship and ability to get back and even a freshness with the event happening in Royal Oak you know that we would take the liability beyond that so, so with our commitment, you will go forward with this event? Yes, okay. with yours and the DDA, there's no turning back. Uh, and that is something we are backing ourselves beyond, that there would be no turning back. Okay. So just for the table, I mean, I would be looking, I mean, Commissioner Mo, I, I agree with Commissioner Colo's motion. I would just want to, to have a motion, and I, I think Commissioner Dubuck has a question here, but um, I would be looking for a motion that just committed the $100,000 for two years and not worry about the sources of the funds. But I, I yield. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Dubuck. I know, I'm going to simplify this. I did, I did not second the motion because I'm, I'm sketchy on the festival. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a sound concept. I'm excited about it. Um, well, I just don't want to, I don't want to make a motion to appropriate $100,000 a year for two years. I want a, a, a motion to, you know, direct staff to enter negotiations for a contract for up to $100,000 a year for the next two years. Um, looking at every possible opportunity to pull dollars back out, I mean, should things go, you know, swimmingly, you know, right? and, um, 
So it looks like the, the 60000 from the DDA here is intended to cover our police expenses, our meter costs. And some of the festival budget. It's um, not, but yeah, we're, we're definitely needing some of that money to, you know, to... Uh, so does that mean that money from the DDA comes to the city? The DDA would be paying some of that money to the city or to you? No, it would all come to us. Okay, so... But then you're paying, but is that 60,000? Uh, yes, we would be paying, car, yes. You're saying coming to you, years. I didn't realize in what you're saying. Yes, we would be writing a check back, just like we do yeah, for okay. Rock and Rides. We would be writing a check back for parking meters unavailable, for the revenue, and for police. So, yes. yeah, I just wanted to make sure I have a better understanding of what's being asked, just the $100,000 um, in, in sponsorship. Uh, and there's not any uh, underlying cost that we're not accounting for here, because it appears that the DDA would be then covering other city costs, the parking loss, the, the the police time, things like that. Yes, assuming that they're agreeable. So we have a meeting next Wednesday. So. Okay. Yes, and that would be, uh, Commissioner Douglas, to specifically ask your question, as long as things were positive on the 15th, um, you know, with the DDA, then we would be 100% on board no matter what happens with any other gap or shortfall. Okay. okay. So. I I'll move uh, to direct staff uh, to uh, enter into negotiations uh, to, you know, uh, uh, on a contract here for up to $100,000 a year uh, for this year and next year, um, you know, with the caveat that you're going to identify any possible opportunity for us to call some of that money back out if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and also bring that contract to us with a report on whether or not we're going to be able to, what, what we can use ARPA dollars for, um, and if not, where we're paying, how we're paying for this. All right. Okay. A motion by Commissioner DeBuck. Is there a second? Can I respond to that or? Well, we have a motion on the table, John. Uh, yeah, quick. No problem. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, we have a second by uh, Commissioner Douglas. So, so that is um, directing staff to enter into negotiations. Um, I guess the question I'll, I will take chair privilege and ask Mr. Witz. Um, is that the? Is that what? I mean, we'd have to get a contract here. The contract wouldn't get here until especially the next agenda item, if we cancel the meeting on the 20th, that contract won't get here until January 10th. January 10th, which is less than a month out from the event. Yeah, that, that would not work. So, so I mean, how, do we, how do we manage that, Mr. Brake, or how do we manage that here at the, the table to ensure that, I mean, there's one, there's a guarantee of cash, but two, then we have the contract approval. Um, I mean, how would that work anyway? Or are we just committing 200 grand without a contract in front of us? No, no. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm asking the question is how do you manage it? So um, you could authorize the city manager yes. and the mayor to sign the contract uh, if everything's agreeable so it doesn't go by this body, but you're putting trust on Correct. the city manager. Um, so that's up to you guys. I mean, we are in a time crunch. It's not. It's driven by the fact that, you know, this is there's an opportunity to save the event, bringing it to Royal Oak, you know. Um, so I think, out of fairness to the to the promoter, we have to have assurances that you know this thing can can go relatively quickly. And I, I don't know, if, you know, there's a, a medium to, to do that. I see Commissioner Colo had his hand up, but maybe Mr. Brake wants to answer first before we go there. I, I would suggest that, if, just as the mayor suggested, that, that you give us the authorization to enter into that agreement um, and per that it has to be reviewed by the city attorney, of, of course, because he's probably going to, to need to know shortly after the 15th um, mm -hmm. and then even wait until the 20th. So that's um, um, those details as far as, you know, Worrying about bringing that back to the, to the next meeting is that uh, you know the the, the concept the, the way that you have it is, and you know we'll we'll communicate that and email that out to you. But if there's a concern, it, as I suggested in the next memo, I mean we can call the the meeting back on, and even if it's a single agenda item. So, Mr. Bell, I'll just add to that we have the ability to, if needed, meet remotely, technically until the end of this month for any reason. Um, so if we couldn't all make it to these chambers, we could spend five minutes, you yeah, know, you ten minutes, an hour, however long it would take to discuss a potential contract. You know, yeah. In a special meeting. Commissioner Prush. 
I don't have any difficulty with um, authorizing a city manager to move forward with this and come up with a contract and to actually authorize them to enter into a contract. We've done enough special event permits over the course of the years that we kind of know what the basic framework is, and this isn't going to be anything exceptionally different than that. And I don't have any problem either with the $100,000 um, commitment. I would want to make sure that in the agreement that, um, that it is handled in the same way that a, a typical special event permit is handled, that we don't cut corners and that we look at all the, the fine print mm -hmm. and make sure that we're covering all of the basic issues. And also that, as you suggest in item number four in your memo, that there's the hold harmless language in there and the other liability protections that we always have. Correct. That's really standard in a special event mm -hmm. permit. Um, so I, I think this is going to be a real exciting event if it comes to pass, and I think it will. Um, but, I, but I do think that we have to go through the process and actually do the special event permit and make sure that we've got it, a firm commitment. We just can't, mm -hmm. we can't cut corners there. Right. But I think it's a doable thing, even with the deadlines, if we authorize the city manager um, and the city attorney to, to craft it and then to enter into it, signed by the mayor uh, or whoever. Um, I think it's a doable thing. This isn't something brand new. We've done this before with different mm -hmm. types of events, and we know how to do this right. Mm -hmm. So this is just another example. It's just a little, it's a little quicker than usual, but we can do it. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Macy? <clears throat> yeah, I think this, I mean, the idea of having Winter Blast here is super exciting. I love the things that are listed, I think. Um, both my younger kids and my teens will have a blast doing all of this. Um, I'd love to see that zip line. I think that would be a cool thing that we haven't seen in Royal Oak before. So my, my only, my hesitation about this, which it seems like we're now skating over this in the motion, um, is about the, the ARPA money and whether or not this is what, that's what we should be using for this. So um, I just, I'm really hesitant to, to say that this was my first and best use of the, the ARPA funds that we have. Allocated, uh, we, we haven't seen a proposal yet on what we should be spending that ARPA money on, um, but it just seems to me like this is, is maybe not the first use of that, so I've, it feels odd to me that we're just sort of getting rid of that responsibility right now of deciding how the, how the, where the money is coming from. Um, we did hear tonight from our finance manager that we have a $4.3 million swing in our last year's budget from the negative to the positive, so it seems like even with our uh, $150,000 toilet, we have some maybe money in our regular budget to be to play with um, for this, and to bring the bringing this event to Royal Oak, Royal Oak I think is a huge win for the city. Um, so I'm really excited about it, but I I just have a hesitation about the opera. No, I, I think Commissioner Macy, that's a good point. I think we have two distinct issues to evaluate in that concept. You have the contract, which is one thing, and then you have the funding. And I think we can also give that flexibility to make a recommendation when it actually comes to cutting the hundred thousand dollars. Does that come out of general fund? Does that come out of a mixture of different things? Because we may have, I think that there are a number of different funding sources we can look into that the promoter should be indifferent to, um, but that you know um, it might work for us. And I think if there are some clever things to do, we can have that discussion with the promoter. But I think um, you're right; it's a fair point. I think we give that flexibility and that agility to the manager to come up with some ideas because I think he's probably thought of those already. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, there's a couple different avenues. To me, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Whatever works best for all parties involved. Um, I'll take, uh, well, I'll do Commissioner Dubuck and then I will break from Robert's rules, Mr. Witz, to ask you a few questions with the motion on the table. So give me a minute, sir. Um, so with regard to the, the use of the ARPA dollars, I understand where Commissioner Mace is coming from. I would argue that our general fund dollars are unrestricted, so we should target ARPA dollars to things we think can actually qualify for, for the use of the ARPA dollars, because we do have 29 million ARPA dollars and, and a limited window to, to spend, invest them in, in these specific areas. And this being something that's creating a outdoor, um, you know, safe activity uh, in the winter months when folks are generally going to be cooped up um, seems relevant. Uh, as well as the small business support that's going to come during a regularly slow time, and, and particularly for you know our service uh, and retail businesses that have been struggling, um, given that that's kind of the central idea here, those two things, that seems very much aligned with with our priorities from, from my perspective. Um, so so that that, that doesn't uh, bother me, and, and and to pull general fund dollars over, 
um, when, when those are unrestricted and we can use them on a great number of things that, that might be other priorities that I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the value in, in that trade-off. Um, is my motion still on the table or did uh, I don't remember if I got a second or not? No, talking about it. Yeah, you got, a, you, you got a second. What's not included in the motion is the uh, probably an amendment to um, authorize the city manager and if you want a double signature of the mayor to sign the contract, um, you know, if negotiated to satisfaction. Um, Commissioner Bruch? Um, could, could the city clerk just repeat the motion that you have in front of you? Because there's been a lot of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a motion, okay. I, I can try. Please use all the um, Commissioner about you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have. Um, we direct staff to enter into negotiations on a contract for up to 100000 for this year and next year, also bringing contract with report to the CC explaining the money disbursement. I just have one comment on that motion okay. that I was just had a concern with, if I could. All right, Mr. Witt, so is there anyone else? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll break Mr. Robert's rules and I, I appreciate it, just because I would rather say it af before you voted than after. The only concern I have with the motion is just using the words up to. We're just asking. We, we can certainly talk about ways that it would come back to the city and, and, and that, that we would have open negotiation on, you know, a way to, if there was additional funding to return some back, I would just not want to use the initial, the comment to be up to, because that sends the spirit that, you know, we are asking for and need that money to be in a position to move forward on the last bit that we need. We just wouldn't want that question to be up in the air, the, using the words up to 100, that it would be for 100 versus up to 100, because up to 100 is is not 100. How about not to anything. exceed 100? Okay. <laughs> no problem. And the other thing I will say on the on the plus side to your debate that on the use of funds is we do not need these funds until well into late January. So we're, this is not an urgent yeah. matter to receive the funds, it's just to know they're coming to pay the bills. So it's not, we have good relationships with vendors. We don't always have to have a ton up front so there's no need for this check uh, immediately. So we certainly can put in there that the check is not payable until you know third or fourth week in January. Um, so that gives you time to, to work that out. There's not a need for the funds immediately. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the table. There's been a couple of suggestions. Uh, the, the one in particular, though, I wanna make sure in the way Ms. Braswell read it, um, did not go to the point or to the extent to have the city manager sign it. So uh, I'll see Commissioner Macy. I move to amend such that it gives the city manager and the mayor authority to sign the contract an amount not to exceed $100,000. Motion by Commissioner or Amendment and seconded by Commissioner Bruch. All right, discussion on the amendment. I'll, I'll just add, I understand where Mr. Witz is coming from, but I think that everything's on the negotiating table, so it's gonna get negotiated in a positive way, so I understand, uh, but, um, so we have an amendment. Is there uh, any other discussion? Call for the vote, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, we now have a motion that has been amended to add that substance, okay. Um, Commissioner Douglas. Yeah, I, I spent some time on the, on the, in the weeds on the details of this and haven't really had an, taken the opportunity, which I want to do, to say how great I think this event is. And, and I'm going to point out that when we extended our social districts into next year, I think I made a little speech up here about uh, the value of winter cities and winter activities. And perhaps we could use our social districts to promote those sorts of activities. And I understand why we will suspend the social district for the period of your festival. But nevertheless, we've uh, achieved, um, I'm just going to declare victory and go home. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just add, right here, our tagline, a long time ago, we put life now playing. And I think we do a great job of that nine months a year. And I think this is a perfect event to really, you know, bring out people from their homes during the winter months, during the post COVID or current COVID era, and come out and not only, you know, love and enjoy our community and our newfound civic area in the long run, 
um, but also the economic impact, the emotional impact um, are going to be really strong. And when I look at the economic impact, if we bring 50,000 people in and each person spends two bucks, <laughs> you know, in downtown Royal Oak, this is a, from an economic point of view, a great endeavor to help our businesses uh, be successful and help our employees that work at those businesses be successful and help those businesses be there because we need them and rely on them for the services that we need and enjoy. And so for me, I think this has all the hallmarks of success as a proven track record of success. We have a local, uh, John Woods Productions is located here in Royal Oak. It's a vendor that you know knows and understands the community. It's low risk. Um, and I think it, it's gonna be wildly successful. And so um, we couldn't be happier or sorry for another city's loss, but it will be our gain. And I think um, year over year, it'll be, um, something that we can all not just look forward to, but really be proud of. Well, you've so. saved uh, a regional traditional treasure yeah. in the winter time from not happening. So right. uh, I think it's, it's amazing. And uh, we have our work cut out for us in, in a lot of ways. And you know, if this is voted on positively, we will honor that vote with uh, a tremendous effort and, and uh, I think great success. This is really a cool idea. One dad joke, come on. Oh, I get yeah. one dad joke per. Oh. oh, don't give me the cold I said shoulder. Bud. It's getting late, Mike. Come it's on. Let's have some fun. We're having a blast up here. <laughs> All right. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All righty. Great. Thank you, Mr. Witz. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you for, I know. Um, your schedule has been tight. We appreciate you bringing this to the city of Royal Oak as an opportunity to, to consider uh, giving some changes a little south of us. And, um, you know, we appreciate the partnership and we're going to really bring some good family fun to our families here in Royal Oak and we look forward to it. Yeah, and, and we're going to reach out to everybody on the Royal Oak team and, and from DPW to continue uh, chats with the police and Paul's team and Todd and, and the commissioners, we want this to be collaborative. We want feedback and uh, would like to put a Royal Oak stamp on it. So thank you all ex extremely, uh, very, very much. And we're ready to get to work. So. Looking forward to it. All right. Thank you. All right. I think this brings us to um, city staff's favorite item on the agenda, which is proposed cancellation of December 20, 2021 city commission meeting. I, I think this is everyone's favorite. Uh, so, um, so we had a rather lengthy agenda this evening, but um, the, the usual issues where we approve like construction contracts, things like that, that it's not coming up. So there are some, uh, the only caveat, we do have a couple of liquor license operational uh, agreements, but we'll hold that off until the January 10th meeting. The only caveat, if there is something that's of emergency and I hadn't thought of that Commissioner Colo gave a really good uh, analogy is that as long as we post the meeting, we can do that remotely. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that, that law is expiring at the end of this month. So, um, but if that's necessary, it would be in consultation with the mayor, but I, I doubt it. It's just, uh, um, so it's the recommendation that we cancel the December 20th meeting and that um, uh, we proceed with the first meeting in January, that the, those items that, uh, taking care of business at that time. Uh, need a motion? Yep. Yes. I'll so move. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion on this? All right, with now, I'll call for the vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Macy. This is actually not my favorite item on the agenda. <laughs> I was surprised to see it on here, and I actually don't feel comfortable with it, and I'm a little bit confused by it. Like, it's in, it's in our charter that we're supposed to meet twice a month, and it's not, you know, we're not like a, a an office building that can shut down and stop doing business. We're a city that serves its, that serves its residents all year round. Um, the city commission is a time for people to come forward and give public comment if they so choose. We didn't have waterworks on the agenda, but we learned about it tonight. Uh, and just because it doesn't seem like there's anything urgent coming up, like that could be true many, many times. I, I just, I'm confused by this. And I also feel like there's some things that I've been waiting for for quite a long time to see appear on the agenda that have not appeared. So as we heard tonight, the marijuana licenses clo applications closed in February. We've had not a single report, nothing to hear about that, and it's already December. Um, I'm, I wish we could hear something about that. Uh, 
I feel like this um, our community benefits pro program, we've asked for it, I think, a year and a half ago now, and we haven't heard anything about that. And then the ARPA funding. So we were all interviewed by GuideHouse in the summer, July, August, uh, and have heard zero proposals of how we are supposed to spend that money um, coming forth. Those are all things I've been waiting to hear from, and so the idea of canceling a meeting as if there's nothing that we have going on, there's nothing that we need to do to serve our residents, and there's and those agenda items aren't critical, it feels really weird to me. So I guess I'm in the minority, but I will not be supporting this motion. So, uh, may I respond? Yes. Uh, so last year we did cancel one of our meetings. So it was the second meeting in August. Um, this also gives us uh, staff time to, uh, there's work that's being done on that and that responsibility is on me to communicate with all of you and to uh, prepare that in the proper context. So those three items that you mentioned, they would not be presented on that agenda at that December 20th meeting. But you bring up a good point that um, the status of what is occurring on those different activities, and that would be rolling into the context of strategic planning that we'll, we'll be talking about. But nevertheless, on marijuana applications, we hear them. So, and you will be getting an update from me in that regard. So, but it's just, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm looking at business transactions that, you know, geared this. It, it's no imposition on staff. If you, if you want to have a second meeting, we will have it. But it's just the, the idea came up. And, um, you know, if any of you plan to travel or, or whatever, um, that it would, uh, you know, uh, be much more accommodating, but that's solely your choice. So staff is available to meet on December 20th, but as far as agenda items that we do not have any other than the, the one caveat that I mentioned, but it's the discretion of this group. Commissioner Reba? Uh, yeah, I think Commissioner Mason makes a really compelling case. I have a hard time voting for this. Commissioner Colo? I would tend to agree with Commissioner Macy also, but I think we need to look at how we schedule our December meetings, maybe in the future. Maybe this needs to be the uh, first and second Monday in the month. That, that seems to be the better way to go about this. Um, and if we want to change the second meeting in December to the 13th, I'm also open to that. As opposed, you know, if there's, I understand that's the week before Christmas, you know, it's, we are a municipality, we do serve people, but we also serve our employees. So if, uh, if, if that's a compelling reason, I'm 100% open to switching the second meeting to December one week from tonight. You mean, th like, this year? I'm, yeah. Okay, we, uh, Commissioner Douglas? Well, so if there's, if there's no business on the agenda for the 20th, what, what makes you think there will be anything on the 13th? I think you should ask Commissioner Macy that question. She could probably give you a long list. <laughs> Mr. Macy? So, I mean, if there's nothing else on the agenda, perhaps we could get a city manager report summarizing the things that have been done this year and what they're working on for the upcoming year. Maybe it'll be a half hour meeting, but it still seems like we are here to do the business of the people and um, it's been on my calendar. So, I mean, I schedule my vacations around those meetings for the most part. Um, I mean, I understand. I don't think, I don't think, I, want, I don't want to pressure staff to hurry up and finish something that they haven't done already. But kids in this meeting, uh, it's, it doesn't feel like a good look. Yeah, so I guess I'll add that. Um, I mean, I get it, Commissioner Macy. I get, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a fair point and I'm not discounting your point. Just two things that are in front of us. One is, you know, if the city manager is saying there's really no business in front of us, okay, then what's the point of, of meeting because there's nobody really that needs any decisions. And number two, we're not just, you know, here for the benefit of our constituents. We also have a responsibility to our staff and our employees as well. And it's been a hell of a year, hell of an 18 months. And they've been working hard, short staff. And if we're gonna compel them to come to a meeting and you know, they're working on these things in the background. Um, they're working on, I mean, I know the things that you mentioned, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of frustration. We need to get some answers as far as where those are at, but it's not because of a lack of working or whatever. There's just a lot of stuff going on right now. And if we're gonna compel folks to come out to a meeting 
um, where there's really nothing to do or prepare for. Now they have to prepare for a meeting to do report outs to the city commission. That's extra work that distracts from stuff they're already working on about in the holidays. And so to some extent, I trust management. I trust that there's no decisions that need to be made. And it's the ability for people to get a little bit of rest and maybe refocus the end of the year on closing out some tasks as opposed to preparing for us. I don't have an issue, you know, supporting this whatsoever. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. Uh, Commissioner Perush? It's not only the staff issue that I'll have to come here if we have a meeting. I mean, it's opening the building. It's having someone sit outside, have the building open. Um, a lot of things go into having a meeting rather than just us showing up and, and voting on things for three hours um, and having the staff prepare the memos. If there really is no essential purpose to having a meeting, there's nothing that needs to be voted on. Having a meeting on the 20th, just because it's in the charter, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, I think we owe it to our employees to give them a break periodically, and I think this is one opportunity to do that, especially when there's nothing, something urgent pending. Um, I, I think going ahead with a meeting on the 20th when there really isn't going to be anything ready to discuss at that point in time would be um, uh, inappropriate for, given the nature of the season. We have a motion on the table? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I thought we did. But then just based on the discussion, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Should, didn't write that one down for this one. Um, okay, any other discussion? All right, well, I guess I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. See a hands of the nose? So the ayes pass. Okay, so the meeting's uh, canceled for December 20th. So that brings us to the end of our agenda. Notwithstanding anything for the betterment of the city of Royal Oak, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Macy. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. We're adjourned. <laughs>